My name is Rick, and I am 36 years old. I never imagined I would be writing this, but here we are. I really need some advice on how to handle this situation because, to be honest, I am still shocked. Yesterday, something happened that caught me completely off guard. I saw my ex-wife for the first time in years and wasn't sure how to react. To explain where I'm coming from, here's some background information. My ex and I were married for about three years, but we'd been together since high school. We started dating as teenagers, and everything seemed perfect. It's funny to think about how simple everything seemed. We even discussed our future together, as if we already knew everything at the age of 17. We decided to marry about two years after graduating from high school, which is surprising given how young we were at the time. We were both only 20. At the time, it seemed like the most natural thing in the world. I was madly in love with Melissa. She was my first love, my first serious relationship, and I truly believe she was my soulmate. I would have done anything for her. No questions were asked. Back then, I couldn't imagine life without her. For a while, we had an amazing relationship. We had a bond that seemed unbreakable. We shared similar interests, had the same high school friends, and everything just clicked. Honestly, our marriage seemed perfect. Sure, we had our ups and downs, as any couple would, but nothing ever made me doubt our relationship. I was certain that we'd be together forever. I honestly thought we had it all. Then everything changed when she met this new group of friends. It's incredible how quickly someone's entire personality can change when they start hanging out with the wrong people. Melissa and I used to agree on almost everything, but once she became close to these new friends, I could feel her slipping away from me. At first it was subtle, and I did not want to jump to conclusions. So I let it slide. Perhaps I was in denial. Perhaps I just didn't want to believe that anything was wrong. However, the changes became more visible. It wasn't just small things anymore. She became more distant, short-tempered, and quite frankly, rude. It was as if she were a different person. One of the most significant shifts was how she began to undermine me, both privately and in front of others. I felt as if I was always walking on eggshells around her, afraid to say or do anything that might upset her. Melissa and I used to agree on pretty much everything. We had the same values, goals, and even sense of humor. We felt like we understood each other in ways that no one else could. We were partners in every sense of the term. And for a long time, that was how things worked between us. But all of that changed after she became close to this new group of friends. Initially, the changes were subtle. It was so subtle that I didn't want to jump to conclusions. Perhaps I was in denial. Perhaps I just didn't want to admit that something was wrong. But I had a feeling that something between us was starting to crack. This new group of friends appeared to have a negative impact on Melissa. They were flashy and extravagant, always out at the hottest spots, partying like there was no tomorrow. I couldn't help but notice Melissa's growing interest in their lifestyle. It began with small changes. She would return home late from their outings, often stumbling drunk. She'd barely say two words before going to bed, but whenever I mentioned my concerns, she dismissed them outright. She'd accuse you of being controlling or paranoid. It was as if anything I said was inherently wrong or inappropriate. I felt like I was walking on eggshells, constantly questioning myself. I attempted to reason with her, telling her that I felt we were drifting apart and that the changes I was noticing concerned me. However, she didn't take it seriously. She simply laughed it off or turned it around on me, accusing me of not understanding her or of preventing her from living her life. That hurt terribly because all I ever wanted was for her to be happy. But I never imagined her happiness would be at the expense of our marriage. She grew increasingly distant as she immersed herself in this new way of life. It felt as if the person I had married was fading away, replaced by someone who was more concerned with flashy things and the superficial approval of her friends than with the life we had created together. It wasn't long before the differences became more noticeable. It was as if she was changing into someone I didn't recognize. The woman who used to be my biggest supporter began to undermine me in ways that cut deeply. We'd be out with friends and she'd casually crack jokes at my expense. At first, it was small things, comments that I worked too hard or didn't know how to unwind. However, things quickly became more serious. She began mocking my career, making snide remarks about how much less I made than some of our friends. I recall one dinner where she laughed and said Rick's job is essentially glorified manual labor. Everyone else laughed, 
and I sat there humiliated. Yes, at first I ignored it because I didn't want to cause a scene. I didn't want to be the guy who was too sensitive and couldn't take a joke, and I definitely did not want to start an argument in front of our friends. But it began to wear on me. It was as if she no longer respected me. When I finally worked up the courage to confront her about it, she simply laughed it off. She told me I was being overly sensitive, that it was all a joke, and that I should lighten up. However, it didn't feel like a joke. It felt as if she was trying to embarrass me, and each time she did it, it eroded my confidence. What hurt more was that even after I told her how I felt, she didn't stop. If anything, things got worse. She continued to make those remarks in front of others, making me feel increasingly insignificant. However, it was more than just public humiliation. Melissa started undermining me in other ways too, especially when it came to making choices. She began to completely disregard my opinions, particularly about our finances. Now keep in mind that I was the one who worked and provided for us. She was still in college and didn't have a job, but she made major financial decisions without consulting me. She'd buy expensive items like luxury handbags and clothes, or she'd plan trips with her friends, and I'd have no idea until later. She once took out a loan for a vacation without telling me. I tried to approach the topic calmly, explaining that we needed to be more financially responsible and that these decisions should be made together. How did she respond? What's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. I do not need permission to spend money. This is our money. It didn't matter that I was the one working to provide the funds. She dismissed my concerns and made me feel as if I had no say in how our finances were handled. It was as if my role in our marriage no longer mattered. I was the one who kept everything together financially, but she acted as if she was in control and any input I had was irrelevant. It wasn't only about the money. She started invalidating my feelings in other areas as well. I recall one argument in particular. It was over something minor, like how we divided up household chores. Now I was the primary provider. Yes, but I never wanted her to think I was leaving her to do all of the housework. I enjoyed helping around the house and thought our system was pretty fair. She'd handle the majority of the chores, roughly 60 to 70 percent of them. But I've always done my share. Nevertheless, during one argument, she completely dismissed me. She accused me of being overly dramatic and overreacting to trivial matters. It was as if she was emotionally gaslighting me, making me believe that my feelings were invalid or that I was somehow wrong for bringing it up. This constant invalidation caused me to question myself. Was I being overly sensitive? Was I really overreacting? Perhaps I was the problem. I eventually stopped sharing my feelings with her because every time I did, she belittled them, and it wasn't worth the fight anymore. But the worst part, the part that truly broke my heart, was how she began to act around other men at social events. She openly flirted with other guys. Even our mutual friends are right in front of me. I am not referring to innocent banter or friendly conversations. I'm talking about overt, uncomfortable flirting. She would laugh a little too hard at their jokes, touch their arm, and give them the kind of attention that made me and everyone else feel awkward. I wasn't the only one who noticed. Our friends could tell something was wrong, but I felt powerless to stop it. One night, I tried to talk to her about it at a party. I told her how bothered and disrespected I felt. How did she respond? You are being possessive and insecure. Stop being jealous without a reason. She dismissed me as if my feelings didn't matter at all. That's when I realized how bad things had gotten. The woman I had fallen in love with, the one who once cared about me, had vanished replaced by someone who did not appear to care about my feelings at all. It felt like every day I was losing more of myself. I felt insignificant, small, and invisible in my own marriage. And no matter how hard I tried, it appeared that she had already checked out. Another issue was that she would criticize me not only in private, but also in front of my family. She seemed determined to make me look bad. She would make it appear that I was incompetent and didn't know what I was doing. It made me feel disrespected and small in front of my family. She would criticize everything I did there, from my job to how I handled things in the house. It was humiliating to be dismissed in front of my own family. When I tried to address it, she simply shrugged it off, claiming she was only being honest. However, it was not limited to private criticisms. She'd make plans without first asking if I was okay with them. She would plan weekends and vacations with her friends. 
She just assumed I'd go along with it and didn't bother asking if I was okay with the plans or if they interfered with anything else I had planned. It felt as if she didn't care about my thoughts or feelings. It made no difference if I had any other ideas or plans. She had already decided to make things worse. It appeared that she began skipping classes to spend time with her friends. I was beginning to feel like an afterthought in her life, like I wasn't a true partner anymore. It was obvious that I was not a priority. I felt irrelevant in our relationship. I tried talking to her about it, but she dismissed my concerns as unreasonable. It was as if everything I said was incorrect. I felt as though I was walking on eggshells. I was trying not to rock the boat, but I was also tired of being belittled and ignored. The breaking point for me was when she insisted on going to a party that I had specifically requested she not attend. I had heard many negative things about this party. It was hosted by a notorious member of our college who regularly throws wild parties, and I'd heard some unsettling rumors about what happened there. Now, I'm not usually one to believe gossip, but when multiple credible sources start saying the same thing, it makes you think. Friends of mine who attended one of these parties confirmed that they were as crazy as everyone said. So when she said she wanted to go, I suggested we stay in and reconnect. I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to spend some quality time together and work things out. But she would not listen. I tried to explain why I was uncomfortable with her leaving, especially given what I'd heard. I told her about the disturbing events that had occurred at these parties and how they made me uneasy. Despite my attempts to reason with her, she dismissed my concerns, snapped at me, and accused me of being controlling and untrustworthy. She refused to let me dictate her choices. She attended the party anyway. That was the last straw for me. I felt totally disrespected and hurt. I couldn't take it anymore. After that, I decided to ghost her. I understand it sounds extreme, but I felt I had no other choice. I packed my belongings, cut off all contact, and let my lawyer handle the divorce paperwork. From that point forward, she communicated with me exclusively through my lawyer. I essentially vanished from her life, even during the divorce process. I avoided direct contact. I was so tired of feeling insignificant. It wasn't because I didn't love her. I did, but I couldn't continue living in a marriage in which I felt irrelevant and disrespected. I felt like I was losing myself, and I needed to take back control of my life. That happened years ago. I moved away, started over, and never looked back. Well, I never looked back. Not until my ex-wife showed up on my doorstep yesterday. I'd moved away, started over, and met someone new after a long period of being single. I didn't want to start a new relationship solely to use the person as a rebound or to fill the void left by my marriage. I wanted to be comfortable on my own first. I went to therapy, worked on myself, and took the time necessary to heal. After several years of focusing on my own well-being, I was finally ready to date again. I've been with my current partner for approximately six years. We've developed a solid and amazing relationship, and I've even considered proposing. We even have two wonderful children, ages three and four, who are the absolute lights of our lives. Life has been better than I could have imagined after everything I've been through. Imagine my surprise and shock when I realized I was alone at home just yesterday. My partner had taken the kids to visit her family over the weekend. I was enjoying the quiet when I heard a knock on the door. I opened it, and there she was, my ex-wife. She appeared to have been crying recently. Her eyes were red. I was surprised to see her standing there after all these years. My mind raced, trying to figure out why she was here. I was completely taken off guard. She asked if I was busy and if she could come inside, but I declined. I told her I was busy, partly because I wasn't ready to confront her or open my home to her. It felt too intrusive, and I didn't want to get into a conversation I wasn't ready for. Instead, we exchanged numbers. She suggested we meet up for dinner sometime, but I didn't make any plans. I gave her my phone number out of politeness, but I did not respond to her dinner invitation. So that's now in the air, and I'm not sure if or when I'll follow up. She mentioned that an old mutual friend gave her my address. That is why she was able to locate me. I'm not sure why this friend would have done that, or if it was even their place to disclose my information. But everything feels strange and unsettling. My partner is now home, and they have noticed that I have been distracted. I haven't told them about our encounter yet. I'm still trying to process what happened and decide how to deal with it. I'm not sure how to approach the situation or how to even begin explaining it to my partner. 
I want to handle it in a way that does not disrupt our lives or add unnecessary stress. For the time being, I'm just trying to sort through my emotions and figure out the best next step. Part of me wants to know why she's here, and part of me is terrified of being dragged back into the mess I fought so hard to avoid. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. I am all ears. Update. Hey Reddit, this is me again. I just wanted to say a big thank you for all of your feedback on my post. I honestly did not expect it to receive so much attention, and I am truly overwhelmed by the outpouring of support and encouragement. Your comments have helped me put things in perspective, and I appreciate each and every one of them. A lot of you suggested that I talk to my partner about what happened, and I completely agree. I've decided that I need to be honest with them about this situation, and I'll discuss it with them tonight. I realize now that keeping it from them was a mistake, and I understand the importance of being open and honest in a relationship. I also haven't decided whether I'll attend the dinner with my ex. I want to talk to my partner first to see how they feel about it. I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable or do anything that will harm our relationship. If my partner is not okay with it, I will not go. Thank you again for your thoughtful advice. I'll sit down with my partner tonight and explain everything. They may be annoyed that I didn't bring this up sooner, but I hope they understand that I was simply overwhelmed and unsure how to handle it. Your help has been invaluable, and I appreciate it. Update. Hey Reddit, this is me again. If you're just discovering this, you can view my profile from my previous post to get a complete picture of what's been going on. I wanted to provide an update and thank you all again for your thoughtful advice and support. So I spoke with my partner last night and explained the entire situation. Fortunately, they weren't upset that I brought it up so late. They were as surprised as I was to see my ex-wife show up out of nowhere. They have never met her. So the whole situation felt a little surreal for both of us. My partner actually suggested that I go out to dinner with my ex-wife, as many of you mentioned in the comments. The general consensus was that it wouldn't hurt to meet up and hear her out, so I decided to follow that advice. I finally responded to my ex-wife's invitation and accepted the dinner. I believe it will be beneficial to get some closure or clarity on why she showed up after all these years. I'll probably update everyone after the dinner to let you know how it went. Many of you seem to be curious about what my ex-wife wants or has to say, and I'm certainly interested in finding out. Thank you again for all of your help and advice. It's been extremely helpful. Update. Hey Reddit, this is me again. I promised to provide an update after going out to dinner with my ex-wife. So here I am providing the details. So, we went out to dinner. It's just the two of us. I had suggested that my partner come along, but he was busy and many of you said it might make my ex uncomfortable and that she might have something very personal to share. So it ended up being just me and my ex-wife. She seemed quite enthusiastic about it. During dinner, my ex described her life since I left. Honestly, it's a long story, but the gist is that she had a very difficult time. After I ghosted her, she struggled to pay our lease and became homeless for a while. She eventually moved back in with her parents, which was significant because she had never been on good terms with them and would have had to be at rock bottom to even consider and then move in with them. She stated that none of her so-called friends assisted her during that time, and she eventually severed ties with them because they were not true friends. She kept apologizing, saying she had spent a long time looking for me and that her friends had misled her. She appeared to be genuinely sorry, and she even mentioned that she had been struggling with drug addiction for some time, though she stated that she was now clean, which I have to give her credit for. It's difficult to overcome that kind of thing. I also shared my perspective on how I've built a happy life since our split. I have a loving partner and two wonderful children, and my job is going well. I have to admit I threw in a bit about how great my job is, mostly to poke fun at her at the time. She demeaned it in front of our friends. She admitted that her friends had played a role in our problems and appeared visibly uncomfortable when I discussed my current situation and family. Throughout the evening, she was unusually touchy, holding my hand, smiling in a way that was more than friendly, and even attempting to touch me under the table. I wasn't having any of it, and I made it clear that I had no interest in rekindling anything. When we were about to part ways, she leaned in for a hug that was more intimate than I was comfortable with. I quickly ended the hug, telling her that I had moved on and would rather not hear from her again. I explained that I only agreed to the dinner for closure because my partner was fine with it and that I needed to move on. 
I returned home and told my partner everything. We spent the evening cuddling and watching Netflix after the kids were asleep, which was relaxing. I also contacted the mutual friend who provided my ex with my address and expressed my displeasure with the breach of privacy. They apologized, and I appreciate their understanding. So that is where things stand. Here is the next story. I was stupid to think that my divorce would solve all of my problems. My problems had only just started. Now where did I get this wisdom? The same place I got the majority of my truly wise insights. School. However, this is no ordinary school. I learned this from what I jokingly refer to as the school of hard knocks. I'm sitting in this little airplane seat, thinking about how intelligent and wise I am. But what I truly am is broken. My self-esteem is ruined. My health is ruined. My faith in justice is shattered. Everything is broken. Oh, well, at least the view below is breathtaking. In another 30 minutes, we will arrive at my temporary haven from the pains of my life. We will arrive at Duke's shortly. After two days of internet searching, I discovered Duke's. It sounded like the perfect place to run away and hide. The description even stated that it was a good place to hide. So why wouldn't I believe it? It was on the internet, and we always believe what we see on the internet, don't we? This is what I read. Duke's Lodge is situated on the shores of one of Canada's most remote but picturesque lakes, with abundant wildlife and some of the best fishing in the Northwest Territories. This is an excellent starting point for day fishing excursions, multi-day trips, and overnight stays at one of Duke's remote hideaways, and for the less adventurous. Nature's beauty surrounds you and is only a short walk from the lodge. With a little luck, you'll see Canadian geese, black bears, beavers, and moose. Dukes offers four furnished rooms in the lodge and six fully furnished cabins on the property. These rustic cabins are ideal for unwinding from civilization and the stresses of modern living. Our two-person cabins include one bedroom with either a double bed or two single beds. The lodge has two rooms that can comfortably sleep four people each. Dukes is also ideal for simply hiding from your wife or husband. Meal packages are available on request. Long-term rentals are also available by request. To make reservations or travel arrangements, contact Duke Wayne. The description sounded so good that I called right away after reading it. The little float plane that left Yellowknife an hour ago is now bumping and jumping over the snow-capped peaks on its way to that picturesque lake, which will be my haven for the next few months. I've never been on a float plane before. It's a bit unsettling. There are only eight seats and one pilot, and the majority of the space in the back is filled with boxes. I am the only passenger. The noise from the props prevents anyone from doing anything other than looking out the postage stamp-sized window. I'd like to sleep and get some relief from my misery, but that's out. What I should do is sit and enjoy the view from 15,000 feet. But instead, I do the absolute worst thing. Possibly. I begin to recall the events leading up to my little float plane ride. Until a month ago, I was married to one of the most beautiful women in the small central Pennsylvania town where we grew up together. Her name is Sheila. The town is called Henley. Sheila was born on the other side of the tracks, the wealthy high society side. However, I came from a working class background. My father worked at the factory her father owned, but something happened that I cannot explain. Despite our different backgrounds, we married so I moved from one side of the tracks to another. That happened five years ago. Two years ago, we welcomed a baby, not just any baby. This little girl is the most beautiful and loving child on the planet. I'm probably saying the same thing every father does, but I know it's correct. Sarah is a wonder. She is pure joy. She is my reason for living. When I look at her, I thank God for blessing me as he has. Sheila and I worked for her father's company, Bloom Enterprises. Sheila worked as a customer relations assistant, and I was an accountant. Sheila's father is Ezekiel Bloom. He's a stately, gray-haired gentleman who nobody in their right mind would cross. He was also the wealthiest man in Pennsylvania, which helped to put everyone on edge. He's also working on his fourth Miss Bloom, Jennifer, a beautiful trophy wife. Sheila and I, like many married couples, had ups and downs, but we were usually able to work them out without resorting to violence. Three months ago, I discovered something that turned my life upside down. I discovered that Sarah is not my daughter. She calls me Data, and I call her my little angel. But DNA tests revealed that she is not my biological daughter. 
I curse the damn test. Why did I do it? I think I was just trying to protect my little princess. We were in the doctor's office for her annual checkup, waiting our turn, when I read an article that stated that performing a DNA test on a child and their parents can help provide an accurate medical history for the child, giving the healthcare provider additional insight during diagnosis and management of the child's health. That sounded reasonable, given that my sister died a week after birth as a result of a congenital genetic abnormality that affected her heart's development. I wanted to know if I had passed on that trait or any other problem. Moving on to Sarah. Perhaps it sounded reasonable, but now I wish I had remained ignorant. I didn't tell Sheila that I had the DNA test done. I did not tell anyone. Because of the elder Mr. Bloom, I was unable to determine who Sarah's father was. He owned everything and everyone in town, so I had no one in town I could trust. If I wanted anyone in town to know about my worries, the story would reach dear old daddy before I could return home. So I asked a college buddy who worked as a private investigator in Washington, D.C. to investigate and learn as much as he could. He discovered that my loving wife, Sheila, had another man in her life. They had been together since before we got married. When I discovered who he was, it came as quite a shock to my system. I had the evidence I needed to burn that cheating bitch at the stake so I filed for divorce. That's when all hell broke loose. Sheila denied it. Her father stood by her like a rock. My out-of-town divorce attorney was outnumbered and outclassed by Sheila's lawyers. Even though I had evidence of her betrayal, the judge ruled in her favor, screwing me completely in the deal. I suppose I should have known what would happen because dear old daddy owned everyone in town, including the presiding judge. I was left with shit. The divorce would proceed. The judge ignored the evidence I presented, and he forbade me from ever showing it to anyone else. If I did, I'd be in jail before I could fart. That was an exact quote from the judge. Dear old daddy just sat there smiling as I had the shaft shoved so far up my rectum. It came from the top of my head. Despite the fact that Sheila lived in the luxury of the Bloom family money, I was required to pay Sarah's child support. Sheila maintained our home. I could keep the money I brought into the marriage. In other words, none. My visitation rights with Sarah were limited to one weekend per month, supervised by a court-appointed guardian. Of course, I lost my job. I've lost my friends. I lost everything, including my faith in the justice system. I became depressed, owing primarily to my inability to spend time with my daughter. That was the worst part of it. Sheila's father hit me the hardest by taking away Sarah, the one thing I loved most in the world. Sheila said nothing because she never showed up for any of the hearings. It was just me and my lawyer versus Ezekiel Blum and his team of attorneys. I was screwed repeatedly. So here I am in this noisy little float plane heading for a temporary safe haven. I'm a refugee from everything rational and just. I did manage to get the shaft out of my rectum before I left town. The Bloom factory, which was my father-in-law's pride, mysteriously burned down. I had nothing to do with it, but I did bring some marshmallows. Wow, this is not exactly what I expected. I spoke as I stood on the rickety dock, gazing up at the lodge. Yes, many people say this when they arrive. It will grow on you. This piece of advice came from the pilot, who was unloading boxes from the plane's rear. The lake and surrounding mountains are breathtakingly beautiful, but the description of the lodge is, well, exaggerated. I had envisioned a grand log cabin lodge with decorative stone walkways and ornate native carvings all over. It appears to be a relatively old, average-sized log cabin on a hill with a dirt path connecting the dock to the porch. The description states that it appears clean, but not as grand. Looking at my luggage on the dock and the winding dirt path up to the lodge, I assumed it would take several trips to get everything up the hill. I took the two small bags and started up the winding dirt road to the lodge. Perhaps I should have read the previous guest's reviews first. Entering the lobby of the rustic old lodge, I hear a deep, gravelly voice coming from beneath the countertop. Could I help you? Yes, my name is Leo Baker, and I have made a reservation for one of your cabins. Yeah, Mr. Baker, I was expecting you, said the lanky, silver-haired man as he stood up. My name is Duke Wayne, and I am the owner of this little piece of heaven. Okay, now do not look at me like that, boy. My real name is Duke Wayne. My parents were big fans of cowboy movies, and they named me after their hero, John Wayne. 
I don't swagger like him. I just kind of limp around. So tell me, Mr. Baker, your registration indicated that you wanted to negotiate a long-term stay away from your wife. That's okay with me. But I'm not going to help you if you're trying to avoid the law. No, it's okay. It's just a small domestic issue. I do not want to be found for a while. I reserved one of your cabins, and yes, I would like to negotiate a long-term rental, if that is okay with you. Great. Actually, we close for the winter in October, but you are welcome to stay until then. The cabins are further up the road on the other side of the hill. It's a bit of a walk, especially if you have a lot of baggage. Oh, and we don't have many customers around this time of year, so you'll only have one other neighbor up there. Breakfast is at 8 o'clock, and we can discuss dinner plans then. If you need anything and don't see me, check the bulletin board over there. If I'm out working as a guide for someone, I'll post a notice. If you don't see a note, simply ring the bell on the front porch and take your seat. I will get there as soon as I can. Here is your key. This is cabin number two. Cabin two has the best view of all the cabins. Enjoy. Thanks. Is there a telephone here? How about cell phone service? There is no phone or cell phone service for the remote. However, we do have a radio that we can use in an emergency or to order supplies. Most radios allow you to make phone calls. We are so remote that everything has to be flown in and out because there are no roads leading to the lake. Great. See you at breakfast. As I walk up the hill with my luggage, I realize how far up the road it is. Maybe old Duke is prone to exaggeration, but at the very least, I got to see a lot of pine trees. Okay, here's number two. Home. It appears rustic, all right, just as the advertisement says. However, it said nothing about small. Perhaps it's bigger on the inside than it appears from here. As I enter, I notice that there is only a bedroom and a bathroom. There's barely enough room to change my mind. I've stayed in larger bargain motel rooms before, but this one has the one thing I want more than anything else in the world right now. Privacy. Let's see if Duke exaggerated his view. I step out onto the small front porch and gaze at the lake. Actually, he might have been underestimating it a little. From here I can see the entire lake. Everything is lush and green, and the water reflects the sun and the surrounding mountains. The snow-capped mountains wrap around the lake, forming a massive green bowl with extreme azure blue water at the bottom. Except for where I am standing. It appears that civilization passed this location by. Unbelievable! I spoke out loud. Isn't that true? The disembodied voice came from a clump of trees to the side of the cabin. This is the second time in my life that I've turned around to see a beautiful creature approaching after saying something foolish out loud. The first time I met Sheila, and now her, whoever she may be. Well, she's something. She is short and thin, with her dark black hair pulled back into a ponytail. She's not frail, just a petite woman. The jeans and red flannel shirt hide her figure, and her boots are far too large for her. Why is she carrying a pail of water? God, I adore her skin. It's clean and clear with the color of warm cocoa. Her eyes are so dark that I cannot tell what color they are. She has a full, sweet smile and a cute pointed nose. She is clearly Hispanic and resembles someone from a Mexican tourism advertisement poster. Except she's missing the typical sombrero. Hi, you must be my new neighbors. I am Annabella. Annabelle Williams. I'm in cabin one, just through the trees. Duke informed me that someone would be coming today. I've only been here a week, so I'm sure I won't know the answer to any questions you may have. Hi. Yes, I am the number two. My name is Leon. Leo Baker. I am pleased to meet you. It is nice to meet you, Leo. Are you going to stay for long? Yes. Actually, I think I'll be here all summer. How about you? I do not know yet. For a while, I suppose. I honestly don't know. What brought you here? I didn't see you bring up any fishing gear, so I'm guessing that's not the reason. Actually, I came here to get away from things at home for a while. It's rough back there right now, and I just needed to get away and think. How about you? Why are you here? The same reason, actually. Problems at home. I needed to get away. Well, it was nice to meet you, Leo. I'm sure we'll see each other around. See you at breakfast. Okay, bye. She looks great walking away, too. It's nice and full everywhere I like. I haven't thought about another woman in that way since I met Sheila. I suppose I am allowed to now that I am almost single again. As I stood there watching her disappear into the trees, a thought occurred to me. I've never been a big believer in love at first sight. I know I've experienced lust at first sight, encounters in college, but knowing you love someone on the first meeting seemed unlikely. But right now, 
As I thought about this lovely woman walking through the woods, I had an unexplainable feeling. I do not think it is lust. She does, however, appear appetizing. But I'm also not sure if it's love. Maybe I felt a familiarity with her. Her entire demeanor made me feel relaxed. I hope to get to know her better. I'm curious if she's what I came here to find. Breakfast was not exactly what I was used to. Duke's breakfast is very basic. Eggs, sausage, toast, orange juice, and coffee all survived relatively well, just as long as I do not have to cook. The other two lodgers appear friendly, obviously. Fishermen. Anyone who wears a vest with a thousand flies attached to it is a fisherman. Perhaps they knew something I didn't because they were staying in the main house. I have not seen Annabella anywhere this morning. Perhaps I should ask Duke. Hey, Duke, where's the young lady with the cabin up near me? Anna, she arrived before eight o'clock. She said she had some work to do. Hell, all she does is sit on the bench at the top of the hill past your cabin and watch the birds. She does not want to be around people much. Something is bothering her. Big time, but she won't tell me about it. Perhaps you can convince her to open up. Yes, I have my own problems to worry about. I cannot afford to have other people's problems mixed in with mine. There's no room in the old head. It could explode. We will do whatever you want. But if I were 50 years younger, I would be pressuring her to open up. She's the most beautiful woman I've seen in 20 years since my Louisa passed away. Thank you, Duke. I will take it under advisement. For the time being, I believe I will simply return to my cabin and sleep. See you at dinner. Damn. I did not intend to sleep all day. I must have been more exhausted than I realized. I guess getting screwed repeatedly by your ex-wife and her family took its toll. Screw him, screw him all. I hope I didn't miss dinner. Knock, knock. Annabella's sweet voice came through the screen door. Hello, Mr. Baker. Hello. Hi. Sorry, I am just getting up. I was only going to take a short nap. I think the thin mountain air is making me sleepy. How are you? I am fine. I was wondering if you'd had dinner. I did not go down to the lodge during dinner time, so I decided to prepare a pot of soup. Do you want to join me? It is quiet up here, except for the bear that comes by every morning. And I would appreciate the company bear. Oh, do not worry. He will not bother you unless you bother him. He just prowls around outside to see what we left out for him to eat. You'll learn quickly enough. You know, I'd like some company too. I think I missed dinner. So your soup is starting to sound appealing right now. Let me clean up a little and I'll come over. It's only through that clump of trees. One hour. See you then. I watched as she turned and walked away, carrying another pail of water. She walked very nicely. And what a nice pair of jeans she has. Her ponytail falls to the middle of her back, swaying from side to side with each step. Unbelievable. This time, I didn't say it so loudly. She did say one hour. So 50 minutes is close enough, correct? Just think. Yesterday I was in Nowheresville, Pennsylvania, and today I'm on top of a mountain in Canada with one of the most stunning women I've ever seen. For the first time in months, I can say that my life is going well, at least for the moment. Knock, knock. Hello, neighbor. Is anybody home? Mr. Baker, you are early. You should know better than to arrive at a woman's home early. I'm not ready yet. Give me a few minutes. I can leave if you like. No, simply sit on the porch and enjoy the view. It isn't as nice as yours, but it's still quite impressive. Oh, and call me Leo. Mr. Baker is my dad. I turned and sat, realizing she was right. The view from this rickety old rocking chair is quite spectacular. I have never seen anything like it. The size of the mountains across the lake is difficult to gauge from here. They looked as if you could reach out and touch them, but I knew they were at least a day's walk away. The silence is deafening. The smells in the air are a mix of pine and whatever Annabelle was cooking. Both smelled divine. Okay, Leo. Soup is on. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, crap. She is dressed for dinner. I'm sitting here wearing jeans and a sports shirt. Maybe I should have worn something nice. I bet she looks stunning in whatever she wears. It's a simple light blue long sleeve print blouse and dark blue slacks. Her broad, beautiful smile is exactly as it was this morning. Or was it yesterday? The boots are gone, and sandals have taken their place. Her hair is now falling straight down over her shoulders. She's absolutely stunning. Hello, Leo. Wake up. Here's your soup. Oops. Sorry. I became distracted for a moment. As you mentioned, the view up here is pretty spectacular. Flatterer. Come here and eat. 
It isn't fancy, but it's edible. It is my own creation, so I hope you enjoy it. I can only offer you water to drink. Is this okay? Fine. Soup and conversation pair well with water. It took us about an hour to finish her delicious soup and tell each other the fundamentals of our lives. I told her about Pennsylvania. She told me about her hometown in Texas. I told her I was an unemployed accountant, and she said she too does not work. I told her about Sarah, and she stated that she does not have any children. It was all very superficial and formal, but it was a start. Leo, why are you here? I don't mean to pry, but you don't look like a fisherman, and this is a very remote location. Someone might come here to escape from things. Is that why you are here? Well, that's a long story. It's still extremely painful. I really don't want to think about it right now, if that's okay. Perhaps later. I will be here for a while. I apologize. I do not mean to pry. That is okay. How about you? Same thing. I have a long story that I do not want to discuss right now. She pauses for a moment to take in the scenery. You have a better view of the lake from your cabin. Maybe next time we'll eat at your place. I'd like that. And thank you for the dinner. Your soup was excellent. I can't believe you made that dish on such a small burner. It was wonderful. Well, I should be leaving. Will I see you for breakfast? Of course. I'll make a point of coming down. Have a nice night, Leo. I arrived at my cabin and stood on the porch watching the sun set over the mountains. It's stunning, to say the least. All I could hear was the wind blowing through the trees and the occasional chirp of a bird. Another unfamiliar sound came from a long distance away. It could be an owl, but I'm not sure. My bird has a good call. Everything looked better in person than it did on my old high-definition television. This must be what heaven is like. I don't usually let my food go cold, but this morning I sat across from Annabelle. Time slows to a snail's pace. It's the same basic food from yesterday. Egg, sausage, and toast with tomato juice instead of orange juice. Today. There's also coffee. But the main difference is the company at my table. I motioned for Duke and he brought us a refill on our coffee. I'll take the other two out on the lake and show them some of the best fishing spots. I'll be gone for most of the day. Will you two be fine by yourselves? I looked at Annabella and responded to both. We'll be okay. Maybe we'll go for that nature walk I read about on the website. As we walked back to our cabins, Annabella said, Leo, do you remember the nature walk you mentioned? You took it as you walked from the dock to the cabins. Wasn't it pretty? Perhaps there was much less to this place than what I read on the website. She made me smile anyway. What are your plans for today? I don't have anything scheduled. I usually sit at the top of the hill on a park bench or on the dock to watch the birds on the lake. When the seaplane arrives, I usually help Duke unload the supplies. He never asked for it, but I'll do everything I can for him. He's giving me a discount on rent because I can't afford much here. Duke may not look it, but he is 76 years old. He has been alone in this place since his wife died 20 years ago. Duke is quite the character sitting by the lake. That sounds good. Can I join you? It would be my honor, sir, she replied with a mock curtsy. So we went down to the lake and strolled. I found two old rocking chairs near a shed and brought them up to the dock. We both sat quietly for quite some time. We just rocked back and forth, gazing out over the lake and toward the mountains. Annabella turned away from me. She appeared to be starting to cry. What is wrong? I asked. Nothing. Now I know something is wrong. Have I said anything? What can I do? I apologize. I have a lot of things on my mind. I do not want to worry you about my problems. I'm guessing if you're up here, you have your own concerns. I do not want to add mine to yours. I looked out at the lake, trying to decide whether I should push her or not. When an old memory came back to me, I remembered a preacher at our church who used to say that if someone had a problem, the best way to solve it was to talk to someone about it. Just talking to someone would make your problems go away. He would say, if you want to talk, I'm willing to listen. You can't give me any more problems than I already have, but I might be able to help you with some of them. That's nice of you. I'd like to speak with someone about all of this, but it's complicated and very personal. It is also embarrassing. You are a stranger. How can I simply dump my personal problems on you? So how about we trade stories? I'll tell you a little about myself, and you'll tell me a little about yourself. You are not required to say anything that makes you feel funny. We can go as slowly as you like. I'll be an open book if you want. Listen, 
Please believe me when I say that I will not judge you for what you have done. I will just listen. Okay, fair enough. But you go first. Where do I start? Usually starting from the beginning is a good thing. I was wondering how much detail was too much. Okay. Here goes. I was born and raised in Henley, Pennsylvania, a small working-class town. My father earned a decent living in the factory, and my mother is what we now call a stay-at-home mom. My older brother and sister now live in different parts of the country. After receiving my master's degree in finance from Penn State, I returned to town because my father had a heart attack and my mother needed me to help care for him on occasion. I met a stunning woman, fell in love with her, and we married. She was a girl from the upper-class area of town. Her father owned the factory where my father worked and much more. He actually owned almost everything in town, politicians and parking meters, too. My wife's name is Sheila. When I returned to town, I got a job as an accountant at the company her father owned. She worked for the same company as her father's personal assistant. That is how we met. Our daughter was born two years ago. God, she made everything so much better. I enjoy being a father, and I would have probably continued to spoil her rotten if things had turned out differently. Do you see? Quite by accident, I discovered that I was not her biological father. That ripped my heart out. I adore her more than anything in the world. But she isn't mine. I discovered that my wife has had a lover since before we were married, and he is Sarah's father. When I found out, our marriage ended. I have all the evidence of her infidelity. So I planned to divorce Sheila, take Sarah, and live with my parents until I got back on my feet. I didn't care that Sarah was not my biological daughter. I adored her and wanted her to grow up alongside me. Sheila's father ensured that this did not happen. He handled the divorce for her, and I received nothing. I do not have a job, I do not have a home, I do not have a wife, I don't have my daughter, and I have to pay her for child support that is not mine. I don't mind supporting Sarah, but I only get to see her one weekend a month. And that is killing me. I have nothing. I was so screwed by the divorce that I just had to leave and figure out how to start over. I'm not sure if I can start over. I just have to think things through. That is why I am here. Did you speak with your wife after you filed for divorce? Nope. I had a restraining order that prevented me from coming within 1,000 feet of Sheila and Sarah. I was fired from my job and evicted from my home. As I previously stated, her father owned everything and everyone in town, so there was nothing I could do, and she never attended any of the hearings. Her father and lawyers handled everything. If they took everything from you, how did you get here? My mother had saved some money and gave it to me so I could get out of town. It was intended to supplement their income in old age. My father couldn't work any longer, and he has a disability retirement pension, so they should be fine. But that's it. They'll be okay. Not as good as they had planned. They will now be able to live, and that is it. I would like to repay them, but I am not sure if that will be possible. I felt tense as the memories spun around in my head. I felt low again. Every time I thought about my life, I became so depressed that I could not think clearly. In a way, my melancholy mood began and mercifully changed the subject. My story is very similar. I, too, came from the poor side of town. My mother and father traveled from Mexico with my older brother and sister. I was born here. We lived on the Mexican side of Plano, Texas. It was not a particularly pleasant environment. My father left when I was eight years old, and my mother cleaned houses for a wealthy family across town. My brother joined the army and was killed in Iraq. My sister married a grocer and now lives in San Antonio with three children of her own. I married a man whom I met at a friend's wedding. Logan worked for a local car parts manufacturer. When I first met him, he was a new salesman for the company, but now he is a senior sales representative. We dated for a while, and he was sweet and kind, always treating me like a princess. We didn't have much money, so when we got married, we went on our honeymoon to a nearby resort hotel. It was wonderful. I thought everything was perfect. I loved him, and he loved me. I just finished culinary school and was looking for my first job as a chef. When he told me he didn't want his wife to work, he explained that it made him feel inadequate. I wasn't happy about it, but I remained at home. Our marriage gradually deteriorated. He began as sweet and considerate, but after a few years, he became demanding and abusive. I stayed with him and endured his abuse for a few more years. Something happened one day that prompted me to pause and reflect on our marriage. I was no longer a princess. I was not pleased. I was in danger. Things happened that I despised, and I just needed to get away. 
So one day, I was searching the internet for a place to go. When I found Duke's website, the next day I took out all of our savings from the bank, sold my car and wedding ring, and came here. I have only been gone two weeks. Sometimes I'm afraid Logan will find me and come here after I run out of money. I'm not sure what I'm going to do or where I am going. I could stay with my sister, but I'd just be another mouth to feed. Logan would find me there eventually. Before I leave, I want to plan where I'm going and what I'm going to do. All I can do is hope. Annabella. Do people call you Anna? What shall I call you? I like Anna. Well, Anna, we're in the same boat. We recently fled a bad relationship and have no idea what the future holds. All I can say is that I have a little money. And if you need help staying here and figuring out your future, I'll be happy to assist in any way I can. We can wait and see how things go. But remember the offer. That is kind. But I do not want to take anything from you. You have your own problems and you will need all of your money. But thank you. I am lost in thought, looking out over the lake, and the conversation has ended. I looked over at Anna, who was also looking out over the lake and had stopped crying. Our long silence was broken by a large fish jumping out of the water only a few feet from the dock. We exchanged glances and smiles, and Duke believes he knows where the best fishing spots are. She replied with a small laugh. This improved both of our moods. We soon started talking about our college days. Anna finds Penn State exciting, even though I try to make it sound boring. Culinary school sounds exciting to me because I enjoy eating. As we talked, we became more at ease with each other. Our conversation turned to our childhood dreams. We discussed our pets and friends. We sat and talked until the sun was directly overhead and the water was perfectly calm. It resembles a mirror reflecting upside-down mountains from the opposite shore. God, I adore this place. Leo, I'm going back to my cabin for a while. I'm going to have a nap. If you want, I'll bring a pot of soup over tonight so we can sit on your porch and talk some more. I truly enjoy your company, is that okay? She stood and ran her fingers along the back of my hand. The reaction in my body was both surprising and pleasant. I'd love it. I really enjoy talking to you as well. I am going to stay here for a while. You go ahead and up. As she left, I turned to watch her walk up the dirt path. I was still amazed and aroused by the beautiful sight of her walking away. I looked at her as she walked away, thinking that everything was now possible. I turned back to see a pair of geese flying over the lake. Before I knew it, I was fast asleep in the old rocking chair. Knock, knock. Is anybody home? Anna spoke through the screen door. Hey, let me help you out there. Place that on the table and I'll see if I can find some bowls. I'm sorry I can't offer you fine wine, but I forgot to pack a few bottles. Perhaps we can include a couple when Duke goes on a supply run. We each prepared a bowl of another of her concoctions and went to the porch to eat. When we put down our empty bowls, I sat back with my heels on the porch railing and my hands behind my head, having already eaten two helpings. She looked over at me, stretched out and relaxed, and said, Just like a man and a dog, a full stomach, and now all you want to do is stretch out and fall asleep. Where did you learn how to cook like that? We had a housekeeper who cooked for us, but she never prepared anything as impressive as this. It was delicious. Thank you. I enjoy cooking and had an excellent teacher in school. He explained that at one point in his life, he was unemployed and had to eat whatever he could find. He occasionally retrieved leftover food from restaurant dumpsters and made soup or stew with it. He named it Heaven Provides Soup. My mom used to call it hobo stew. It works, no matter what you call it. I simply took his idea of combining whatever you have and arranging it in an enjoyable manner. I'm happy you liked it. We sat silently for a while, gazing at the lake. A squirrel dashed out of the brush and stopped just a few feet in front of us. As soon as it stopped, another rushed out and pursued the first. They ran around and around, chasing each other until they both vanished into the brush. I always enjoy a little after-dinner entertainment, I explained. She simply smiled. Leo, you stated that your marriage ended when you learned about your daughter's father. What do you mean by that? Before I began, I took a deep breath and fully exhaled. I was married to Sheila for five years. I had no idea she had a secret lover all along. Perhaps I was too stupid to notice the clues. I'm not sure why I didn't know, but I didn't. When I received the DNA test results, I came to the only conclusion I could. Sheila was having an affair. I did not want to believe it. Hell, I couldn't believe it. 
but all of the evidence was present. So I asked a college friend, can Holton help? He works as a private investigator in Washington, D.C., and has a team capable of finding out almost anything. He discovered the identity of Sheila's lover. He had photos and videos of them in bed together, and he discovered evidence that they had been dating since she was in college. How could I believe that my wife would be unfaithful to me? I needed to see for myself. I watched the video and was completely blown away. I watched my life and marriage crumble in front of my eyes on that TV monitor, I was heartbroken and sick. I cried. I beat the walls. I wanted to die. I wanted to kill someone. I spent several hours riding my motorcycle, reflecting on what I saw and what I should do about it. I could only find one solution. Get a divorce. I'm very sorry. That must have been terrible for you. It's insane that someone could live two lives and not expect to be discovered. What she did to you deserves to be punished. Oh my God, what a bitch. Oops, I'm sorry. Sometimes it just comes out. I understand a little Spanish. That last part is exactly correct. I've said the same things myself, but I'm not sure I want revenge right now. I just want to get as far away from her and her controlling father as possible. I'm still thinking. Anna took the dishes back to the cabin. When she returned, I turned to hide the tears in my eyes and wiped my face before she noticed me. I believe she saw it anyway. You know, Anna... Just talking about the whole thing makes me hurt all over again. I adored Sheila and can't understand how she could betray me like that. You understand how painful it is to discover that the person you loved is not who you thought they were. I could see in her eyes that she was all too familiar with the pain I was describing. I placed my hand on hers and she began to speak. Leo, I told you this afternoon that I am comfortable talking to you. I understand that we've only known each other for a short time, but I want to be as open with you as you have been with me. Please understand that some of what I am about to tell you is difficult for me. It's extremely intimate. I'm not sure if I can even say these things out loud. Please have patience with me. I said just talk and don't worry about me. I will not interrupt. I will be patient. And I do not want you to do or say anything that could harm you. Okay, here goes. I told you that my marriage began beautifully, but eventually devolved into a nightmare. My initial signs of trouble were subtle. I didn't think anything of it because I adored my husband and wanted to please him. When we first married, our sex life was fantastic. We made love with passion, and only on occasion did we have sex for fun. We didn't do anything weird. Logan expressed a desire to experiment a few months after we married. I wasn't sure what he meant, but I loved and trusted him, so I said okay. We were making love one weekend when he suddenly became a little rough. He began pushing me and twisting my skin with his fingers, leaving marks all over me. He turned me over and grabbed me from behind. It was the first time I'd had sex like that, and it hurt a lot. I was bleeding slightly when he finished. He simply smiled at me and stated that I was a good wife. He said he wanted more, and what he did over the next few weeks was downright brutal. He would spank, slap, and pinch me until I was crying. He used various toys on me, which hurt a lot, but the more it hurt, the more he liked it. He deteriorated into insane behavior, the more I screamed and begged him to stop. I remember one time when I was sick with the flu or something, and he told me to get into bed and prepare for him. I explained that I was sick and couldn't. He grabbed me, ripped my clothes off, and began slapping me until I fell to the floor, crying. He dragged me to the bed and tied me to it face down. He began to laugh and hit me on the bottom and back of my legs with a stick. The more I protested and begged, the louder he laughed and hit me. I screamed for him to stop, but all he did was tie a pillowcase over my mouth so he couldn't hear me. He hit me repeatedly until I passed out. When I awoke, I was untied, but I was in a lot of pain. I was so angry and hurt that I couldn't sit down because my bottom hurt so badly I could hardly walk. He was passed out on the couch in the living room. He had passed out drunk. I didn't realize he was drinking because he did it outside the house and in the car. Soon he was drinking constantly, including at home. I tried to avoid him when he did. Another time, he returned home from an afternoon of drinking with some of his friends and was upset that dinner was not on the table when he walked in. It was the first time he hit me with his fist. He hit me in the stomach, and I collapsed to the floor trying to catch my breath. When I tried to stand up, he kept pushing me back down with his foot while laughing, so I stayed on the floor, crying. 
he went over to the couch and passed out. I didn't know what to do, so I dashed into the kitchen and quickly prepared his dinner, setting it on the table. I awoke him and informed him that his dinner was ready. He simply slapped me across the face. I fell backwards across the coffee table, landing on my back. He got up and went into the kitchen, and I heard dishes break. Some of them crashed into the living room. I tried to run into the bedroom and lock the door, but he caught me and began hitting me again. I was practically unconscious. I don't remember what happened after that. I woke up in bed with him crying next to me. He apologized. He hurt me, and it would not happen again. He promised. I was bruised all over. This time, there was so much blood that the sheets became soaked. I told him I needed to go to the hospital while I was lying down, but he refused. He did not want anyone to know what he had done. It took me two days to get out of bed again, and even then I could only see through one eye. I was alone when he went to work, and when he got home, he just cried and apologized. I adore this man. How could he have hurt me so badly? He stated that he was going to stop drinking. I listened to him cry and blame it all on his excessive drinking. I believed him, so I did not tell anyone about what he did. I thought it wouldn't happen again. He stopped drinking and things returned to normal for a few months. He came home one day from work and told me he had found a digital camera in the parking lot at work. It was a very expensive looking camera and I didn't believe him, but I said nothing. He told me to go get dressed in my best outfit so that we could go out. When I finished dressing, he entered the bedroom and informed me that we would not be going out. He instructed me to sit on the bed. He began taking photos of me with the new camera. I wasn't bothered because he was smiling and paying attention to me again. I began to feel like a princess again. He instructed me to stand up and undress. I knew he wanted to photograph me without my clothes on, and I didn't want to upset him, so I did. He was telling me how to pose and what I should do with my hands. I said I did not want to. He gave me the same look he had when he was drunk, and then he started yelling. He called me many different names, all while photographing me. I was crying, and he was still taking pictures. He removed his belt and threatened that if I did not pose well for him, he would turn me over and beat my bottom. So I did. He kept taking photographs. When he was finished, he threatened that if I didn't do it whenever he wanted, he would print out the photos and distribute them to all of my friends and neighbors. I did not want that, so I posed for him, danced for him, and stripped when he asked me to. He alternated between taking pictures and simply watching. Then he took me. Every time was difficult. I did whatever he asked because I did not want to be beaten again. He came home one day, drunk, but I couldn't smell alcohol on him. I suspect he'd been smoking something. He grabbed his camera and demanded I strip for him, which I did. He asked me to do some weird things, but I declined. That's when he struck me with the camera. My eyes filled with blood and I began to scream. I believe one of our neighbors heard me scream when someone knocked on the front door. He instructed me to grab a towel and clean up my face. He answered the door and informed whoever was present that I had fallen and injured myself. He came into the kitchen, took out a butcher knife from the drawer, and threatened to cut me if I told anyone about what he did. I was so scared that I just cried and promised him I wouldn't tell anyone. He entered the living room and passed out on the couch. He came home drunk several more times and threatened me with a knife, and I did what he told me. I was very scared. I didn't think about anything other than what he told me to do. I just wasn't sure what to do. Jesus Christ, I thought my life was a disaster. This little beauty has suffered abuse. Shit is not the right word. She was tortured by a drug-crazed lunatic. I wasn't sure what to think. I was starting to shiver. I was so angry. I wanted to kill someone again. As I looked at this frail flower, tears began to well up in my eyes. I wanted to take her in my arms and tell her that everything would be fine. I wanted to hold her. I didn't know her well enough to do that. Instead, I said nothing and didn't move. I simply shook all over. Leo, are you okay? Please say something. Leo! After a moment, I looked up at her and exclaimed, My God, that's awful. That is the most disgusting thing I have ever heard. I cannot imagine how you felt. I'm very sorry. Oh, my God. She rose from her chair, approached me, and placed her hand on mine. She gently pulled the tense hand from my chest and placed it on her cheek. She smiled. My tension began to ease and my shaking subsided slightly. She whispered softly, Thank you. You have no idea how good that makes me feel. We just kept holding hands for a long time. I think I'd better take what's left of the soup and return to my cabin, she said as she placed my hand on the armrest. I'll see you for breakfast. When she left, 
all I could think about was her and her awful, brutal husband. I finally decided I needed to go to bed. Because of the images she conjured up in my mind, I had a difficult time falling asleep. Along with the images of my wife and her lover, I now had more dreadful thoughts. However, these were different. These images depicted an innocent young woman being tortured. All I want to do is come to her rescue. A fitful sleep eventually led to blackouts. My thoughts. Dew poured the coffee and observed. It appears that someone had a rough night. He's correct. When I looked in the mirror this morning, I saw only bloodshot eyes and drooping shoulders. Have any aspirin? Look what I can find. I took a large sip of coffee and looked around the room. The two other lodgers were just finishing up their breakfast when I nodded hello to them. Anna was nowhere to be found. Duke returned with a bottle of aspirin and placed it next to my coffee. This high mountain air will deceive you. It doesn't take long to get that headache because the oxygen is slightly thinner up here. Take it easy for a few days so your system can adjust. Why not go out on the lake today? I'll get you one of the boats so you can see how good of a fisherman you are. Good morning, Duke. Anarchist. The old gentleman's cheek, causing him to blush. Isn't this a beautiful morning? Ask a friend here. He looks as if the bear slept with him last night. Duke refilled his coffee cup. She finally took a good look at me and said, Good God, you look terrible. What happened? The thin mountain air caught up with him. Duke replied that he will be fine in a few days. He walked back to the kitchen with the coffee pot. Are you going to be okay? She asked. Yeah, I'll be fine once the room stops pulsing. Duke suggested a day on the lake. I may take him up on it. I haven't gone fishing since I was a kid. Perhaps you should not go out alone. I don't know how to fish, but I can keep you company. That might be nice. Got any sunblock? I will see what Duke has. We sat quietly while Duke ate his usual breakfast of eggs, bacon, toast, orange juice, and coffee. I had a side order of aspirin. You appear happy this morning. Was the old preacher's advice effective? Confession is beneficial for the soul? Perhaps it did. I do feel a little more relaxed. Perhaps telling a friend about your problems has some value. You are my friend, right? I did pour a lot of heavy stuff on you yesterday. Nah, it's okay. I can handle it. Being macho and all that. And yes, I am your friend. As we left the lodge after breakfast, we heard Duke yell behind us. I'll put one of the little boats in the water near the dock. Take it out whenever you want. Thank you, Duke. I took my hand and we walked back to our cabins together. Around ten o'clock I met Anna on the dock. She dressed in a white long-sleeved man's shirt and blue jeans. She now wore tennis shoes and a white baseball cap. Her hair was pulled back into a ponytail again. For a woman dressed in ordinary grungy clothing, she looked stunning. It could have been due to the big smile on her face when she saw me approaching. I haven't had many beautiful women smile at me recently. I found some sunscreen. Duke has a supply cabinet in the back room that holds everything. How are you feeling right now? Better. The headache is bearable. Maybe a day at the lake with you is exactly what I need. She smiled as I said, with you. She has a beautiful smile. It took a few minutes to figure out how to start the engine and get moving. We drove around for a while before turning off the motor in a location where we could see all sides of the lake. At the same time, the mountains that surrounded us made our small boat appear tiny, and the lodge looked like a postage stamp from where we were. I looked around and noticed that Duke had prepared everything for us. The poles were ready, and there was a small box containing some bait that resembled small dough balls. At the very least, let us appear to be knowledgeable. I said, I attached a dough ball to one of the hooks and handed the rod to Anna, who dropped the line over the side of the other pole. I left the spoon in place and inserted the line into the water. She watched me and imitated what I did with the rod at the other end of the small boat. She tentatively held the rod and reel and asked, Now what do I do? Please wait, I said, and be patient. We sat there for a few minutes before Anna said to me, Leo, I didn't think about what I was doing yesterday when I told you my story. Well, that's part of my story. I did not tell you everything. You became tense while listening, and I believe I may have added my problems to yours. I didn't consider that. And I'm sorry we don't have to talk about it any longer, if it injures you. But truthfully telling you makes me feel better, and to be truthful with you. Anna, I dreamt about what you told me. I thought about how brutalized you were. 
Looking at you now, I can't imagine anyone wanting to do that to you. You're so delicate, gentle, and beautiful. How could someone attempt to destroy that? That is monstrous. Did you just call me beautiful? Yes, you are gorgeous. When I look at you, I see a gorgeous woman. Any reasonable man would, but that's only the outside. I can only see a small portion of what's inside, but what little I see is also beautiful and very fragile. Thank you. I have not been called beautiful in a long time. There are many stupid people in the world. Thank you for not being one of them. Anna's rod jerks downward abruptly. What was that? That is a nibble. Hold on to the rod, but not too tightly. Wait to see what happens. We sat silently for a while, gazing at her rod. Nothing happened for a very long time. Relax, he's gone. I said, Anna looked from the rod to Leo. May I tell you something? Sure, anything. You make me feel like a princess. You are a princess. She smiled at me and said, thanks. We relaxed and looked around, admiring the breathtaking view of the mountains and sky. After a while, our gazes met. She smiled warmly at me. I smiled back, thinking that the spectacular view had just gotten a lot better. She scooted over to sit next to me and placed her hand on my shoulder. We sat there for a long time, looking out over the lake as the rod jerked downward. Hey, our friends are back, I said. I took her rod and placed it in her hands. As soon as she grabbed it, the tip jerked violently downward. Then I said, hold on, I think we'll have a visitor. Pull up and reel the rod in a few feet. The rod started to bend, pull, and shake violently. I do not know what to do. Help me, Leo. Simply hold the rod tightly and place the back end in your hip. Take the other hand and begin reeling in, slowly, tentatively. She did what I said. The rod was bucking and pulling, but she kept hold of it while reeling. Finally, a large splash occurred a few feet from the boat. The fish broke the water. Holy shit, keep reeling. Simply keep reeling. I will get the internet. I grabbed the net and looked over the side into the water. As I dipped deeper into the water, I retrieved what every fisherman dreams of, a massive lake trout. Ha ha, look what you've got. This bad boy is enormous. He's a beauty. All Anna could do was stare wide-eyed. I know what we'll be having for dinner tonight. You called it soup. Heaven provides generously, honey. Heaven just served dinner. I took the line with the fish, transferred everything to the cooler, and placed our dinner inside. Wait until Duke sees this. He'll fall over. Anna was still in shock. Almost immediately, she jumped up and threw her arms around my neck, letting out a gleeful scream while rocking the boat. Whoa there, sit down. We do not want to go swimming just yet. She let go and sat down, looking sheepish. Sorry, it's just that I had never caught a fish before. So, let's see if he has any relatives down there. I baited the hook and released it over the side. I sat beside her and placed my arm around her shoulder. She smiled the widest she could, rested her head on my shoulder, and wrapped her arms around my chest. Thank you, she replied. For what? Thank you for making me happy again. Thank you. She held my chest for a long time. Everything was quiet and peaceful on the lake. It was so calm that I thought I could hear her heartbeat. I turned my head and kissed the top of her head before resting my cheek against her ebony hair. We were both at peace for the first time in a long time. Holy mother of God! Where did you get those? Duke yelled as I took the fish out of the cooler. I've been searching for him for years. Well, the little lady grabbed him and I said I had no idea what I was doing. Leo just coached me after he got hooked. Did I do well, little lady? That is a record. Trout are found in this lake. I bet he weighs 40 pounds or more. We need to get the camera before we fillet him. You two are going on the bulletin board. We all walk up to the lodge, smiling and talking about the one that didn't get away, and I catch him. Duke went inside, grabbed his camera, and instructed her to pose on the porch with her prize and the lake in the background. We smiled as we looked at the pictures he took. Yes, sir, you two will eat well tonight. I'll take him and get him prepared. You'll be here at six o'clock for dinner. My treat. Anna and I walked back to our cabin, smiling and holding hands. All of our troubles were temporarily forgotten. A lake trout made our lives easier. When we arrived at my cabin, I turned it around and placed my hands around her waist. We just stood there for a while with the mountains providing the backdrop for the photograph. I pulled her close to me and slowly lowered my lips to hers. Leo, I am unable to. 
She backed away, looked down at the ground, and began shaking in my arms. I, oh God, I apologize, I cannot. Hey, calm down, calm down, what is wrong? I lifted her chin and looked into her eyes. I apologize. I just had a flashback to before and became scared. He hurt me. I guess he hurt me more than I realized. I understand you wouldn't, but it's just... Shush. I understand I should not have pushed you. No, it is not you. It's me. When you kissed me, it brought back terrible memories of Logan hitting me and having rough sex. Your lips just triggered it. I'm very sorry. That is okay. I will be here when you are ready. I am not going to do anything to harm you. You are aware of this. I understand. Please, just hold me. We stood there embracing for an eternity. Her shaking has subsided after a while. She seemed calm, and I could feel her breathing more slowly against my chest. She appeared frail in my arms, so delicate and small. I will keep her forever if necessary, until her last demon was gone. The sound of a bird chirping nearby breaks the silence of the woods. We turned to look, but it was gone. When we turned back, I noticed her beautiful dark eyes smiling at me. Then her lips moved into a matching smile. Thank you. Those were the most beautiful words I had heard all day. Anna moved slowly to close the distance between our faces. Her eyes met mine as she slowly moved her lips to lightly touch mine. There was almost no touch. It felt so gentle before she pulled back and smiled even more broadly. Time seemed to stop as she looked into my eyes and smiled again. She moved to kiss me, but this time her touch was more intentional. We parted with a tender and quiet kiss. We both smiled and gazed into each other's eyes. I said, there's nothing like a first kiss. Nothing will ever be more tender or full of promise. Everybody has a few in their lifetime. Nothing beats this, except for the second kiss. I moved again, kissing her lips. This time our kiss lasted longer and went deeper. If our minds hadn't been so preoccupied with our kiss, we could have felt our hearts beating together. Tap, tap. Hello? Is anyone home? I asked. Hello, self. Come in. I am almost ready. His voice came from behind the bathroom door. And you mention men and their cliché habits. Do what you need to do. Or just wait. After all, who am I to complain? I walked into the small cabin and stood. There. Is Anna finished with her face in the bathroom? I watched her finish her makeup and smiled. You are gorgeous. I said. She is beautiful. She was wearing a lovely yellow print top that hugged her body in all the right places. Not too tight. Just right. And the color brightened her face. The jeans have been replaced by a black skirt that ends at the knees, with sandals on the feet below. Her hair was in a ponytail again, but this time from the side rather than the back. She turned to me and extended her hands. Now I'm gorgeous. Let's go eat. I'm starving. Not quite yet. Not until I have messed up some of the makeup. I leaned in to kiss her, but she pulled back, saying, No, no. Not now. Later. First, we eat. She took my hand and led me out of the cabin down the hill. As we walked to the lodge, Anna spoke. You look good. Who would have expected to bring a blazer to a fishing lodge? She kissed my hand and intertwined her fingers with mine as we walked straight to your table. Duke made an exaggerated bow as we entered the dining room. Your meal is waiting. I pulled her chair out and Anna sat. Duke draped a white cloth napkin over her lap, then placed one on mine. He went to the kitchen, leaving us alone in the room. We sat quietly and looked into each other's eyes. Anna broke the silence, saying, I love Duke. He is such a gentleman. He was probably a ladies' man when he was younger. His wife must have been very pleased. Duke returned carrying two plates of trout and vegetables. He stated that my wife was the reason I left. After we met, I never looked at another woman again. She was my first and only love. We were together for 30 years. Thirty glorious years. Her ashes are located on the hill just past your cabins, behind that small park bench. You placed the plates in front of us, said bon appétit, and turned away, leaving us to enjoy the meal and each other. The meal goes by too quickly. At the end, Duke pulls out a pear half drizzled with chocolate sauce. Just leave everything here when you're finished. I'll get to it tomorrow. I'm about to go to bed. Good night to you two. After the simple dessert, we sat holding hands and gazing into each other's eyes. Anna stated that this has been a perfect day. Thank you for sharing this with me. It is not over yet. We can stay up tonight and see if there is an aurora. 
I'd like to do some stargazing with you. How about that? Sounds like the perfect way to spend the day in the mountains away from the city lights. The stars above are beyond description. You can see what appears to be a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy. We were both unfamiliar with such a display because we had grown up in cities where the ground lights drowned out the stars. But tonight, the sky is ablaze with stars. However, there is no aurora borealis tonight. Perhaps tomorrow. We sat in front of my cabin on two rickety old chairs, looking up at the sky and holding hands. An owl hooted occasionally and crickets chirped, but there were no other sounds. Not even the wind. On one side, there is a loud crack. We both turned to look in that direction, but everything was dark and we couldn't see anything. Another crack, followed by another from the same direction. Then came a rustling sound from the bushes. I think we have a visitor. I suggested we make a quiet retreat until he leaves. A good idea. I don't want to end my perfect day by becoming a bear's dinner. We both quietly get up and walk backwards into the cabin, closing the door. So what should we do now? I asked. I can think of something, she said, slyly eyeing the bed. I took her in my arms and kissed her as if it were our last. It's powerful and deep, but not too much for the petite woman. She kissed me back. We made love. Once finished. We lay panting next to each other for a long time before either of us dared to move for fear of disturbing the other's rapture. I turned to look at her and noticed that her face was turned away. She seemed to be crying. Anna? What is wrong? Are you okay? I asked. She returned her gaze to me, showed me the tears running down her cheeks, and said gently, Leo, there's nothing wrong. Everything is correct. Exactly right. I haven't felt this way in a very long time. I'm not referring to the sex, which was fantastic. I mean the feeling of being loved. You always loved me. We were making love. I could feel it. I hope you can do it. It was exquisite. Oh, Leo, everything is perfect. Phew. I thought for a moment. I was losing touch. She slapped my back with a smile on her face and said, No. Funny man, you haven't lost touch. I really enjoy your touch. Just don't joke about it. Please hold me. We came face to face and wrapped our arms around each other. I nuzzled her neck and anarchized my ears. We stayed like this until we fell asleep in each other's arms. As the morning crept over the mountains through a slow, steady rain, I became aware of the bed and the warm body in my arms. The soft pitter-patter of the roof echoed throughout the small room. We didn't see the light of day or hear the rain on the roof. We could hear each other's heartbeat as we lay there in a warm morning embrace. Good morning. Good morning, my beautiful lady. Would you like to skip breakfast and stay in bed all day? That sounds great to me. As long as you're willing to bet on it. Just let me get this beer out of my mouth and I'll be back to keep you warm and safe all day. I got up and went to the bathroom. Anna remained in bed, looking at me as I went about my morning routine. I could only imagine what she was considering. It surprised me, but I felt like I had always known her. But in reality, it has only been a few days. I returned to the bed and said, your turn. Anna got up and closed the door as she entered. Now I'm lying there thinking about Anna, and I'm starting to get aroused. I covered myself up and tried to appear unconcerned. When Anna returned, she laughed at the protruding bedding and jumped under the covers alongside me. We both just stayed there, hugging each other. Quiet now, aware of the pitter-patter on the roof. Leo, don't take this wrong, and you don't have to respond. But I have something to tell you. I believe I love you. I know it's crazy because we've only known each other for a few days, but I feel like I've known you forever. I'm at ease around you and feel safe in your arms. Well, I can't think of anything else. Wow, maybe it's crazy, but I've never felt better in my arms than I do with you. Right now, I want to concentrate solely on you and forget about the mess I just left Anna. Honestly, I could feel that way about you. But I can't think about loving you while I'm dealing with a serious problem. I do not want to hurt you. I want you to be happy, and if you are already, that is all I care about. I'm not concerned about anything or anyone else right now. Right now, all I care about is you. Stop thinking and hold me. Anna and I stayed in bed all day, talking and loving. We made love twice more, exactly like the first, gently, lovingly. We forgot to leave the cabin and eat. The rain stopped the next day, but everything remained wet and muddy as we headed to breakfast. I missed you yesterday. What have you done? Stay in your bed and listen to the rain, Duke replied with a knowing smile. 
My lawyer and I used to do this. We had some fairly exhausting rainy days. Yes, something like that, I admitted, smiling as I exited. Anna, please listen. Today's Tuesday supply flight arrives around noon. Nobody is scheduled to accompany him, so you'll be the only guests after the other two leave today. If you have any special requests for meals, please leave a note, and I will include it in their next delivery. We need to plan ahead of time because the plane only arrives on Tuesdays and Fridays. Can we fit anything in? I asked. Yes, almost anything that can be purchased at a supermarket, liquor store, or hardware store. Is there anything else you might have to wait a while for? But you can place an order for anything at any time. She smiled and bit into her toast. The same float plane that flew me in a few days ago arrived at noon, loaded with boxes of supplies, mostly food. We helped Duke unload the items and store them in the pantry, while the two fishermen carried their luggage to the plane for their return trip. Everyone worked quietly and efficiently. Duke sat down with us after the plane took off and explained how the lodge operates. He's been doing everything on his own for the past 20 years, and only his late wife knew how. Duke is a funny old buzzard. He told us about the winters, and how everything is completely isolated for two or three months, while the lake almost completely freezes. Sometimes the snow is so deep that he can't get from the lodge to the dock. The float plane delivery service is discontinued, so he must plan for everything he will require in the interim. He occasionally goes hunting for fresh meat, but it doesn't last all winter. The loneliness is the worst part about spending time at the lake during the winter. Now that my Louise was gone, he admitted, and I'm getting older and don't have any children to leave this place to when I die, but I don't plan to die anytime soon. The three of us spent the majority of the day talking about the mountains, the lake, fishing, hunting, bad winters, and nice people. The conversation never strayed from the reason why the two refugees were hiding out with old Duke. After a day of pleasant conversation, Anna asked us to stay at the dinner table because she wanted to go make stew for dinner. I want to and I will not accept no as an answer. She disappeared into the kitchen and shut the door. Duke admitted, I like that gal, but there is something sad about her. She appears to have perked up since you arrived, though. I hope you two hit it off. She deserves to be happy. Duke, I really like her, too. I have my own problems and don't want them to affect her. I'm going to take it slowly, and maybe we can make each other happy for a while. I promise not to hurt her, so don't worry. I am cool. Anna soon appeared, carrying a large tureen filled with steaming vegetables and fish. Duke, this is my heaven-provided stew. I hope you enjoyed it. She dashed back inside and grabbed the iced tea and biscuits before sitting down to eat. After a few bites, Duke leaned back and said, This reminds me a lot of a stew my Louisa made. She called it fish chowder. It far outperforms anything I could create. Oops, sorry for my language, but it's fantastic. Thanks. We all ate quietly except for the occasional slurping noise. Hello, Leo. It's me. Can I come inside? Anna whispered through the door. I opened the door and said, hi there, good looking. I was just thinking of you. What brings you out at this time of night? I was thinking about you both. My cabin is way over there while yours is way over here. They say we should just combine everything and live together to save money. Duke is already aware of the situation and appears to be fine with it. How about that? Can I come inside? Of course. You shouldn't return tonight in case that bear is lurking around. I just found you. I do not want to lose you. She snuggled next to me in bed, pressing her body against mine and wrapping her arms around my neck. Leo, if you don't want to respond, I completely understand. However, you mentioned that your wife had a lover that you were unaware of. You mentioned that it disgusted you. How could you stay with her after finding out? I don't know. I just avoided her whenever I saw her. All I could think about was what I saw in the video. Every time I wanted to strangle her. I really wanted to be with Sarah. If being with Sarah required me to stay with that deceitful woman for an extended period of time, I had no choice. From the moment I found out to the day I filed for divorce, I avoid her like the plague. I found extra projects to do around the house or at my parents, and I took Sarah to the park and playground whenever possible. All I wanted to do was find an attorney and get out of there. When the paperwork arrived, everything exploded. Her father became involved and my problems only got worse. I've already told you what happened, but I was eventually beaten to the ground. What is the worst part? 
One cannot even discuss it. It's just so disgusting. I threw up after finding out. Even now, thinking about it makes me queasy. That was the deal breaker. I knew right away that I needed to get away from her and her family. Then don't discuss it. Do not even think about it. I cannot imagine anything worse than what you have already told me. Come here and hold me. Don't think about her anymore. I'll help make things better. We lay there for a long time, holding each other silently. I lifted my head from her shoulder and gazed into her dark eyes. Thank you for being here. I said this before my lips touched hers. Our kiss was tender and warm, and it reminded me that there are still good people in the world. The black-haired beauty in my arms is one of them. Our lips parted, and I lowered my head back onto her shoulders. Leo, she whispered. There's more to my story that I can't tell you. The other day, I believe I can now. I want to because I believe that doing so will help me overcome some of my own demons. Confession, as your preacher said, is good for the soul. Believe it or not, this is what I have to say. Worse than what I previously told you. Can you bear to hear it? Anything for you. After that, I may want to kill someone, but I will listen to whatever you have to say. So this happened after what I told you the other day. Remember when I said Logan threatened me with a knife and demanded that I do whatever he said? So one day he came home high on whatever he was smoking and told me to get dressed up because he had a surprise for me. I went into my bedroom, showered, and changed into one of my nicest dresses. When I finished, I went into the living room where Logan was sitting and talking to a woman. He gave me a strange smile before introducing me to her. She was his boss at work. Her name was Faye something. She was a large woman, not overweight, but tall and strong with short blonde hair. I thought she was pretty until she spoke. She spoke in a grave voice and used a lot of swear words. She just sat next to Logan, smiling at me. Logan mentioned that he was showing my pictures around at work, and Faye thought I was attractive and expressed her desire to meet me. I didn't realize it at the time, but the photos he was showing were ones he took of me with his new camera, the ones in which I was naked and doing various activities. Anyway, Logan had brought Faye home to meet me. He told me that it was important to him to make Faye happy, so I was supposed to entertain her that evening. I had no idea what he wanted me to do, so I just stood there and looked at the two of them. He said something like, I will explain it to you so you understand. You will do whatever Faye wants and I will sit and watch. You have to keep her happy. So I am pleased that if you do not do what she wants or hesitate for a moment, you will be punished. Do you understand what I mean? I simply stood there, stunned. I wasn't sure what to do. Faye stood up from the couch, approached me, and stood about an arm's length away. She just stood there, smiling at me. Then she walked past me and into the kitchen, where she grabbed two beers from the refrigerator before returning to the couch and sitting beside Logan. She smiled at me while standing there and told me to strip for them. I wasn't sure what to do. I felt terrified. If I ran away, Logan would become enraged and beat me. I wasn't sure what to do, so I began to undress. Faye instructed me to put some music on the radio and strip to it. I did my best to dance along with the music, all the time. They sat together and watched. When I was done, Faye stood up, approached me, and began touching me. I was so scared that I was shaking. She wrapped her arms around me and kissed me. I've never kissed a woman before. I wasn't sure what to do. I started crying. Logan became enraged and began yelling when he saw that I was crying. Faye simply watched as he yelled at me. Then he grabbed my arm, pulled me into the bedroom, and pushed me onto the bed. Faye followed us and stood over me next to the bed. Logan sat on the foot of the bed and told Faye, She's all yours. Faye began undressing next to me. I looked at Logan, who was simply sitting there smiling and watching both of us. She did bad things to me. I just laid there feeling disgusted. I'd never had sex with another woman, let alone while my husband watched. She got up, dressed, and started talking to Logan while I lay there. I overheard her say that she wanted to come over again. Logan promised to make sure I was available to her whenever she wanted. When I heard that, I cried into my pillow. Logan came to bed after she left and forced me to have sex with him. And he was as brutal as usual. After he finished, he told me about his plans. He mentioned that his boss enjoyed my company and wanted to come over again. He said he would let her if she gave him a specific customer's account at work. She said she would. He also told me that he'd been showing my photos to his co-workers and they liked what they saw. 
He told me that from now on, I'd have to be ready when he called to entertain his friends, co-workers, and customers, and do whatever they asked. He told me that he had already planned for me to attend a party with some of his drinking buddies the following weekend. He told me to be as polite to them as I was to his boss. They were paying him $500 for me over the weekend. Then he told me he had other plans. I was also planning to attend the company manager's meeting the following month and be available for everyone to have sex with all week. He was going to make a lot of money both for me and at work. He was to be given responsibility for more important accounts. Leo. He intended to spread the word about me to his co-workers and friends. When he said that, I knew I needed to leave. So the next day I ran away. I watched as she fell silent and stared into the distance. Her face began to contort, and her eyes filled with tears. Oh God, I can't go on. Her entire body shook as she sobbed heartbreakingly. I took her into my arms and hugged her tightly. Everything is all right now? You are safe and away from those people? You're with me now? I will take care of you? I will love you? I whispered the words in her ear. She continued to cry, and the tears ran down her cheeks and onto my shoulder. Her sobbing subsided, leaving only the rhythmic sound of her breathing. She cried and fell asleep in my arms. When I awoke, Anna was sitting naked, cross-legged on the bed, looking at me. Morning was all I said. Did you say you loved me last night? She asked. Yes, I believe I did. What you told me last night was terrible. You didn't do anything to deserve such brutality and I will see to it that you never have to go through anything like that again. The only way I can make that happen is by loving you and keeping you close to me. You are safe and loved when you are with me. I felt something from the moment I saw you. I wasn't sure what it was, but now I believe I do. Yes, I believe I have fallen in love with you. I'm so happy. Thank you. Leo, my prayers were answered. I love you, but I really need to go pee. Then we need to go down for breakfast. I said as I began to move toward the restroom, and I just smiled. Duke, you should have a full-time cook here. That way you'd have more time to do the things around here that need to be done. I offered my advice over a plate of pancakes. I cannot afford one. When Louisa was alive, she did the cooking while I handled everything else. She was an excellent cook. I make do. You will not starve. How about Anna? She's an excellent cook. Perhaps she can work for you to help with the rent. I know we're the only ones here right now, but if you get some more lodgers, maybe she can help out a little. Is this okay with you, Anna? Of course. If you don't mind, I'd be happy to assist you. Duke. Okay, I'll think about it. I have eight people. Do. On the next plane, we'll see how things go. We all returned to eating our pancakes at the end, as we sat back in our chairs to digest. I asked Duke how to make a phone call. I need to call someone and tell them where I am. Well, all I have is a radio. The people in Yellowknife can connect you to an operator who can make the call for you. It's not cheap, but it's doable. Can it be used after breakfast? Sure. I will show you how, Anna said. I will just leave you two alone. I'm returning to the cabin to clean up a bit. If we're expecting visitors, I'd like to look my best. She smiled at us before leaving. Making a phone call using his old radio setup was complicated, and I had to charge the call with a credit card. Duke let me use his so there would be no charge on mine that could be used to locate me. I will pay you back. Just add it to my bill, I told him. Duke politely left me alone to speak. Hello? The voice came from the old radio. Hello, Mom. It's Leo. Oh, God, Leo. How are you doing, baby? Where are you, Mom? I am fine. I'm currently out of the country and can't tell you where. If someone should ask, you cannot lie. What's going on there? Is there anything I should know about? They are looking for you, Leo. Mr. Bloom is madder than hell. When the factory burned down, he quickly blamed you. The police have issued a warrant for your arrest. They even called the FBI. They came out and spoke to your father and me. We weren't sure where you were, so we couldn't tell them anything. I believe there is someone watching the house in case you show up. Things are quite tense at the moment. What have you done with the package I gave you? I put it in the basement behind some canned peaches. I did not open it. How about Sarah? I don't know very much, son. Sheila asked where you were. She said she wanted to talk to you. Sarah was with her. She's fine. She only wants her data. I'm not sure if Sheila was looking for you for her father or if she genuinely wanted to talk to you. She seemed quite upset. So I don't want to talk to her. All I care about is Sarah. As long as she's okay, I'm fine.
Leo, I know your divorce will be finalized in a few months, but could you at least talk to Sheila? Was what she did truly bad? You mentioned that she had an affair. Is there any way you two can talk and work things out for Sarah's sake? Mom, I only told you some of what happened. Sheila was having an affair during our entire marriage, but that's only half of it. I don't want to tell you or anyone else the rest, because it would only hurt Sarah. Perhaps someday, but not now. Okay, fair enough. I suppose I'll just have to trust you. Mom, there is something else. I have met someone here. Her name is Anna. She's fleeing a bad situation, just like me. I want you and Dad to meet her. But I'm not sure how I'll make it happen since I can't return home. I'll have to figure out another way. I just wanted you to know that I am not as depressed as I was when you last saw me. I am better. I am actually happy when I am with Anna. I think I'll be okay as long as she's with me. Just wanted to let you know. Hello. I'm very happy for you. After all that heartache, you deserve to be happy. Call and tell us what your plans are. I love you, son. Take care. Bye, Mom. Oh, shit. What will I do now? The FBI is out looking for me. I did nothing but that. Fat Bloom has the police accusing me of torching his factory. What will I do about Sarah? Christ, what am I going to do with Anna? Now that I've met her, I can't do anything to hurt her. Hell, she has her own issues. What can I do to help her? How can I get away from Sheila's old man, be with Anna, and build a future with her free of the past? Oh, what a mess. The next day, I watched as the float plane landed and dropped off eight men. They carried expensive-looking luggage and fishing gear. Duke greeted them with a large, warm smile. Welcome back, gentlemen. It's nice to see you again. I believe this concludes your ninth year. Everything remains the same as last year, except the fishing is better. You got to see the photo of the one caught yesterday. It's a real monster. We all helped move the men's luggage up the hill to the lodge that afternoon. They launched four boats to get in, a little fishing before sunset. Duke asks Anna to help him in the kitchen with dinner. She prepared the fish. The men caught and steamed fresh vegetables. Duke prepares the salads and bread at her direction. For dessert, Anna made a simple pear cranberry crisp. The new lodgers were very excited about dinner and requested that the chef come out and visit. Sheepishly, Anna entered the dining room. All I could do was sit at another table and observe. One of the men began speaking. Madam, we'd like to compliment you on your dinner. Everything was delightful. We expected Duke's usual rustic fare to match the lodge's rustic charm, but this was entirely unexpected. I understand food. See, I own several restaurants in Detroit, Chicago, and Cincinnati, and none of our top chefs could match what we had just eaten. I know better than to inquire about your secrets. But if you ever want to leave here and come work for me, you have a standing invitation. Thank you so much. I am a little embarrassed. Your compliments, and I will keep your generous offer in mind. I'll see what surprises I can put together for you for breakfast. Anna approached my table, sat down beside me, and rested her head on my shoulder. I smile from ear to ear. The compliments boosted her self-esteem. The restaurant owner got up and approached us. Sir, be proud of your wife. She's an excellent cook. I am serious about my offer. Please think about this. I said yes, and I am proud of her. But we aren't married. We both met here. Refugees from difficult situations back home. I am sorry to hear that. The bad situations at home, that is. Where are you from? Anna said. I am from Plano, Texas. I told them I was from Henley, a small town in central Pennsylvania that no one had ever heard of. One of the other men spoke up, stating, I know some people in Henley. What is your name? My name is Leo Baker. Nope, I don't recognize the name. Where do you work? I used to work at Bloom Enterprises. I was an accountant. I do know that name. What a shithead. Bloom cheated me and my manufacturing company out of a $1 million contract several years ago. Losing that contract set my business back significantly. We're only now recovering. Yes, I recognize the man you mention. I was married to his daughter. The man got up from his table and approached ours. No shit. He said you are Ezekiel Bloom's son-in-law. I was. I recently got divorced. Let me tell you, I'm not sorry to be leaving that family. What happened? The restaurant owner inquired. Simply put, my wife cheated on me. I filed for divorce. Bloom, an old man, ensured that I left with nothing. There's no money, no job, no daughter, nothing. I came here to escape from everything for a while. That is where I met Anna. Here. 
Another man got up from the large table and approached. Did I hear anyone mention Bloom Enterprises? Yes, I did. I used to work there. I mentioned that the name is very familiar to me. I work for the Justice Department's racketeering section, and Mr. Bloom's company is on one of our watch lists. I can't go into detail, but the bottom line is that we're looking into Bloom for possible violations of a dozen or more federal and state laws. I'd love to speak with you about what you know in greater detail at some point. Wow, I had no idea about that, but I have absolutely no doubts. Bloom owns everything in town, including the judge who presided over my divorce proceedings. One of his factories caught fire shortly before I left town, and I am the prime suspect. There is even a warrant out for my arrest, and I'm sure he had something to do with it. A fourth man got up from his table and approached ours. I apologize for interrupting, but I was listening from over there and wanted to pop in for a moment. You see, I am a lawyer. I'm just getting to know things. How do you know your father-in-law owns the judge? That is a pretty serious accusation. So, I had a video of my wife and her lover together. I am doing well, you know. The judge completely rejected it. He told me it meant nothing, and if I ever showed it to anyone, he said I'd be in jail faster than you could fart. That sounds exactly like the pompous a-hole judge I know in Henley. I have always suspected that he stole some money. He also screwed me out of a couple of clients. And I only wish I could prove it. It sounds like you need some assistance unscrewing. Perhaps we can speak and see what is possible. I know I want to help. The manufacturing worker said yes. I'll go to any length to make Old Bloom regret his actions. The fifth man stood up and approached. Pay attention, everyone. This sounds like we need some military-style coordination. I haven't seen any action since Afghanistan, and I'd love to take down some big shots to help the little fella. No offense, Mr. Baker. None were taken. I suggested that we go to the porch, have a few drinks, and discuss this with all of the high-priced brains in this group. You can bet the farm that we'll come up with something spectacular. What do you say, Mr. Baker? Anna chimed in. This is where I exit. Thank you all for everything, Leo. I'll see you at the cabin when you get back. Wake up and tell me about your plans to take over the world. Gentlemen, good night and thank you. I watched from the porch as Duke walked back to our cabin. I heard him thank her for making the group happy and invite her back in the morning to help with breakfast. After they were out of sight over the hill, we began to discuss the possibilities. When I returned to my cabin well after dark, I found Anna curled up in bed asleep. She appeared so calm, as if she didn't care about anything. I knew that if I woke her up, her problems would flood back. So I slipped into bed next to her, spooning her body into mine. Whether Sleeping Beauty knew it or not, we had another absolutely perfect day. That night, the Aurora Borealis worked its magic for us. But we were asleep in each other's arms and couldn't see anything. After breakfast, Anna and I sat on the dock to talk. Anna. Before I tell you about our conversation last night, I have a question for you. What would you like to do with your husband? You haven't mentioned divorce, but I don't see an alternative. I do not want you to return there and get hurt, or worse. What are your thoughts? I've considered filing for divorce, but if I did, he would follow me. And if he found me, I'd pay dearly. He's very possessive. I considered just staying hidden. And maybe he'll move on and meet someone else. I can't go back there. Why? What do you have in mind? Yesterday after you left, we began discussing everything that had happened to me and my problems. I told them I didn't want vengeance, I just wanted some justice. They had a lot of great ideas, and believe it or not, these men have a lot of power and money between them. One of the men who did not come over to speak with us is the CEO of a large computer company and is worth millions of dollars, perhaps billions. He claimed he's just shy. Remember the lawyer we talked with? His name is Alan, and he knows Ken. My friend is a private investigator who assisted me in learning more about Sheila and her lover, and the one man who came over and said, we need some military coordination, is a retired colonel from the Army Special Forces. He's quite something. He will coordinate everything they do back home. When everything is ready, he will call, and I will be able to resume my work. All I have to do now is sit tight with you and wait for his call. Olio, that sounds great. I'm very happy for you. Do you think they can help me? So that's the best part. That lawyer fellow knows a divorce lawyer in Dallas who he describes as an absolute shark. By the time we return, everything should be ready. And all you have to do is meet with the attorney once, sign a few papers, and wait for Logan to sign before coming back here. 
According to what he said last night, getting your husband to sign will be the difficult part. The army major said to leave it to him. Anna, I think everything is going to be fine. I'm not sure what to say. Why would strangers want to help me? To them, I am just a cook at a remote fishing lodge. Why me? Believe it or not, there are good people in the world. I'm sure these men see something in you that you might not see in yourself. Something I already knew about. Anna smiled, a beautiful smile. We sat on the dock, holding hands and staring out at the water, each thinking our own thoughts about what would happen. Five days later, we assisted the eight fishermen in loading their luggage and coolers full of freshly caught fish onto the float plane. I kissed each man on the cheek to express my gratitude for everything they do for us, even the shyest computer geek. The restaurant owner handed Anna his business card and reminded her of his employment offer. Please call he said. After they took off, Duke went back to the lodge while Anna and I took a boat out on the lake to fish and talk. Anna wonders when this is all going to happen. I do not want to leave Duke without a cook. I'm thinking two weeks, maybe three, if everything goes as planned. You should be back here within a few days. If you want to visit your mother and sister, I can arrange that as well. Okay, I just want it to be over so we can be together. Will you return here afterward? Absolutely. When I finish cleaning up the mess from my previous life, I intend to return and start a new one with you. Anna scooted over to sit next to me and rested her head on my shoulder. We must have caught the only fish in the lake because we didn't get a single nibble the entire time we sat there. We simply sat and enjoyed each other's touch. Three weeks later, at sundown, Anna and I sat on the porch of our cabin discussing the trip home the following day. Both of us were nervous about what was going to happen. Despite the meticulous planning, Murphy's Law remained in effect. You know, the law that states that whatever can go wrong will go wrong. It's almost certain that not everything will go as planned, but I had hope. Leo told me, I'm really scared. If I wasn't in your arms right now, I could be back there, bound to a bed and screwed by everyone he knows. I'm still afraid he will find me. Shush, that is not going to happen. I assure you that you are now and will always be safe. I will always be here to protect you. We sat with one another, watching the sun set behind the mountains. I gently stroked her cheek as a tear streamed down her soft skin. Her gentle breathing indicated that she was now relaxed. Anna, since you have told me your entire story, I believe it is only fair that I tell you about my final demon. This is as difficult for me to discuss as it was for you to tell me about your background. But bear with me while I tell you this, Anna. When I discovered that my daughter was not mine, I wanted to kill Sheila. When I discovered who her real father was, I wanted to kill her lover as well. I was really angry. If they had been present at that time, I believe I would have killed them. I am glad they weren't. I went looking for Sheila and I found her with her lover. I knew exactly where to find them, and I saw them in love. I was so overwhelmed seeing them all together that I believe I, my brain has frozen. Anna. The man who made love to Sheila was her father. She and Ezekiel Bloom have been lovers since before we got married. The photos I had seen confirmed it, and the video I watched showed them in his bedroom making love. I said I knew exactly where they would be because she said she was going to see her father, and I found them in his bedroom, just as shown in the video. Anna Sarah is his daughter. That is why I do not want to tell anyone. It could be extremely painful for her to discover that her father was also her grandfather. If anyone discovered that she was the result of an incestuous relationship, she would be shunned. I cannot have that. I'll do anything to protect her. Oh my God, Leo, that is unbelievable. How could she? I mean, who is she? What? Oh shit. I just can't say anything because I want to strangle the woman who hurt you. My God, I am so sorry for your daughter. Damn, Anna. When I saw them in bed together, I began running away. I naively assumed that divorcing her would resolve everything. Instead, it made matters worse. After I left, I came here to escape from everything, and I found you. Now I understand that we have a future. As soon as we close the door on the past, everything will be over. I know one thing for sure. And after all of this, we'll be together. That is, if you prefer me alone. Of course, I want you. You make me feel like a princess. The next few months may be difficult, but once they are over, we will be together forever. You don't realize how wonderful that sounds. You are aware that after tonight, we may not have the opportunity to spend time together for a while. I want you. I want to make love with you one more time before we leave. I really love you. 
We kissed for a while, standing in the fading daylight, when we parted lips. We both entered the little cabin. I sat on the bed as Anna closed the door. We made love. She regained her senses. She looked longingly into my eyes before kissing me on the lips. Wow, that was fantastic. Oh, wow. She relaxed and collapsed onto my chest in a heap. Sleep was our last reward, Duke. Anna will return in a week at most. I'll be gone a little longer. I'm aware that the lake will freeze over and that flying in will be impossible, but I'll do everything I can to return much sooner. Just keep an eye on my little chef while I'm gone. Do not worry about me. I was here 20 years before you arrived, and I'll be here another 20 minutes after you leave. I will keep an eye on your little one for you. You two should just be careful and have a safe trip. Duke, an anarchist, slapped his cheek before entering the small plane's doorway. I shook the old buzzard's hand and followed her inside. Finally, the pilot entered, closed the door, and locked it. As we took off, I noticed Duke standing on the dock, waving goodbye. Anna and I entered the tall glass building in downtown Dallas to see her shark of an attorney. I had a mental image of what she would look like, but the little gray-haired woman who welcomed us into her office was very different from my expectations. Good afternoon. My name is Jane Oakes. She sat behind her large mahogany desk, smiling softly at Anna. Don't let my appearance deceive you. When the opponent is unfamiliar with me, it can work in my favor. But once they've met me, they'd rather not see me again. Now, Anna, I've heard everything from my dear friend Alan, but I'd like to hear it from you for the next half hour. Anna recounted her experiences with happiness, despair, beatings, and forced sex. She even mentioned me. It is worse than I was led to believe, but do not worry. We'll put an end to this. You will receive your divorce and everything else you desire. I am extremely confident. Don't worry. I'll just get the paperwork for you to sign, and then I'll explain what you need to do from here on out. Anna burst into tears as we drove to her sister's house after signing everything. I wasn't sure whether they were tears of sorrow or joy. The crying continued until we reached the interstate, when she wiped her eyes, blew her nose, and turned to place her hand on mine on the steering wheel. I keep thanking you, don't I? I can't wait until it's over. She turned to look out the window, watching the countryside go by. Anna was reborn in her sister's house. She laughed and played like a child with her nieces and nephews, running around the backyard chasing their large dog. I sat and watched a new woman emerge, and it made me love her even more. Her mother arrived later in the day, and the three women vanished while the men sat in the backyard with a beer or two. When they finally emerged from whatever conference they were having, everyone looked teary-eyed. Anna and her sister went to make dinner, and her mother took my hand and led me out to the front yard. Mr. Baker, Anna told us what her husband did to her, and she told us everything about you. She stated that you have some issues of your own to resolve before you two can be together. She also stated that she loved you and felt safe around you. I believe my daughter does not always know what is best for her, but she is a big girl and can do whatever she wants. I just wanted you to know if you ever did anything to her. If you do what her jackass ex-husband did, I will hunt you down and kill you like a dog. You had better believe me. I'll find you and kill you where you stand. Do you understand what I'm saying? Treat her well and I'll bring you my fabulous 16-layer cake every Christmas. I am putting my trust in you. Take care of my little girl. She deserves the best. I am sure the shock of her warning was visible on my face. I could only answer yes, ma'am. She reached up, grabbed my head, pulled me down to her level, and kissed my forehead. She smiled at me with the same smile Anna does. She took my hand again and led me back to my lounge chair and beer. Every day we stayed at her sister's home. Every night we stayed at a nearby motel on the interstate, and Anna was incorrect. We did have time to make love while waiting for her attorney's call several times. Five days after we arrived in Dallas, Anna received the phone call she had been waiting for. Hello, Anna. This is Jane. Well, everything is done. Your husband signed the papers, making you a free woman. And once the court system has completed its work, the decision will be final. This could take anywhere from three to six months. So, until you receive the final proclamation, you are still married. You can go anywhere and do anything you want, except marry again. Wait a while on that. I'll admit that when I spoke with your ex, he was fairly insistent that you two would stay married. But as I understand it, 
He received a visit from someone in the army and was convinced that signing the papers was in his best interests. I'm not sure who your friends are, but I might want to borrow some of their time. I have your phone number in case something important happens. Take care and have a good life. And with that, Anna's abusive marriage ended. I took everyone out to celebrate at a local ice cream parlor. Everyone had a wonderful time, including Anna Love. You just go back and continue doing business. I said we were standing on the concourse of the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport holding hands and saying goodbye. Anna had to go to one terminal to get to her flight, while I had to go to another. Everything is going to be okay. I'll call Duke and leave a message when I arrive at my parents' house. I'm not sure when I'll be able to call again, but when I do, it will be with good news. Take care, and remember that I love you. I love you too, she cried. We separated. Our fingertips were the last thing to touch. We turned to go our separate ways. It takes two hours to drive from Harrisburg Airport to Henley, and I planned to arrive at dusk. I didn't want to be discovered too soon, so I parked a few blocks from my parents' house and walked through the woods on the same paths I used to take as a child. I approached the back door with my suitcase and knocked. What's going on? Who's out back knocking on that door? My dad's voice sounded sweet in a manly way. It's me, Dad, Leo. Damn, Mom, it's Leo. Come out here, boy. Get in here before someone notices you. Dad, it's good to be home. Hello, Mom. Boy, I'm glad to see you, too. Listen, I have to tell you what I've cooked up so you don't worry. We should sit down and talk now. Let's enter the living room. I just want to put my feet up and relax. I spent the rest of the evening telling my parents about my plans for the next few days. If everything went according to plan, it should be over within a week. They laughed at the sheer audacity of the scheme at times, but also at what would happen to the people involved. We had a good time, and I felt relaxed and ready. Before going to bed in my old bed, I called Duke and Anna and left a message informing them that I was safe and that everything was fine. Early in the morning, I heard the newspaper land in the driveway in front. I walked out in my shorts and robe to pick it up, standing in front of the vehicle, stretching the biggest day. That should let everyone know that Leo has returned home, I whispered to myself. It only took 30 minutes for three police cars to arrive. Knock, knock. I answered the door and heard, Leo Baker, I have a warrant for your arrest. Please come out quietly. I turned, winked at my parents, and walked out. You know, handcuffs aren't as painful as I expected. Sure, I had to ride to the station with my hands behind my back, but it didn't hurt all that much. I was photographed, fingerprinted, and placed in a cell by myself. Now all I had to do was sit and wait for the shit to hit the fan, which didn't take long. Within an hour, the stately Mr. Bloom stormed into the station and demanded to see me. I could hear his voice all the way back in my cell. Within a minute, he was standing in front of me, shooting bullets at me through his steely gray eyes. I'm going to burn you up! You have the audacity to destroy one of my factories and then return here as if nothing had happened. I will make sure you never see the light of day again. And you can simply say goodbye to your little girl. She'll forget you ever existed. When I finish with you, you will wish you had died. I watched his tirade and thought, God, I love seeing that big vein on the side of his head pulse like that. I didn't have a chance to say anything to him when he was summoned back to the office by a frantic-looking deputy. I simply sat back down and listened. I heard a lot of yelling and screaming coming from the outside office, and eventually someone yelled, Go get him now! The same wide-eyed deputy returned and unlocked my cell, telling me to follow him. I walked into the office and saw Alan, the lawyer I met at Duke's, standing there glaring at Mr. Bloom. Mr. Bloom was now a brighter shade of red than he was two minutes ago. Alan, my lawyer friend, said, Mr. Baker, are you all right? Have you been treated well? I'm okay. I'm just a little confused about why I'm here, that is all. Well, we're just about to clear everything up. Alan took out his cell phone and called, simply saying, We're ready now. In about a minute, a tall man in a suit entered, accompanied by two state police officers. He approached Mr. Bloom and held out a manila envelope. Mr. Ezekiel Bloom, the beet red-faced man, answered yes. What do you want? Mr. Suit stated. Sir, I have a warrant for your arrest. The charge is tampering with government officials, specifically Judge Owen Carter and City Fire Marshal Thomas Johnson. 
I also have a federal arrest warrant for you on charges of racketeering and money laundering. I have issued a cease and desist order for all Bloom Enterprises operations, until such time as a federal grand jury can convene on the charges. I've attached a copy of the lawsuit we're filing against Bloom Enterprises in the name of Leo Baker for wrongful termination. This lawsuit notification is currently being delivered to corporate management. Finally, I have another warrant for your arrest on charges of incest with your daughter, Sheila Baker. A warrant is currently being served on her. He turned to the deputy sheriff, handed him an envelope, and announced, Sir, as a duly appointed official of this town, I hereby notify you of a lawsuit against the town of Henley for wrongful imprisonment. You are both duly served. I had to sit down to hide my big, fat smile. Mr. Suit turned to me and handed me another manila envelope, stating, Mr. Baker, I have a court order quashing all charges against you until the fire marshal's report is reviewed. In addition, a hearing to review your divorce decree will be held tomorrow at 10 o'clock a.m. Another judge will hear your case. The former presiding judge is currently being investigated for misconduct in office. Throughout the process, we were served with legal documents. My attorney, Allen, never took his gaze away from Mr. Bloom, who, by the way, was now sitting in another chair looking particularly depressed. Leo, let's go. You are a free man. Alan spoke quite loudly. We turned and walked out the front door. He smiled all the time. When we pulled up in front of my parents' house, he drove me there. He turned to me, extended his hand to shake mine, and said, Good luck, Leo. I will see you at the hearing in the morning. All of this is a small gift from your fishing buddies. I believe things will become a little quieter around here, at least for you. God, I love small towns. Good night, kind sir. He nodded, saying goodbye. My parents came out and greeted me at the curb as Alan drove away. How did things go, son? My father asked. Better than I could have possibly imagined. Let's go inside and get some food. I'm starving. The divorce review hearing was very different from the first. First, Sheila arrived, accompanied by only one attorney. Second, when we entered, the new judge appeared very concerned. And third, let's just say I had some hope this time, because Alan was sitting next to me. The review lasted nearly four hours. This time, evidence of Sheila's infidelity and incest was accepted. And almost immediately, the judge mentioned that she was an unfit mother. In the end, he reversed a few key points. Sheila had significantly more savings and income than I did, so the child support I was required to pay was removed. Child custody was reversed. I was granted primary physical custody. I was now going to receive child support. The house remained hers, and the income split remained consistent. In other words, I'm still broke. I wasn't concerned because I had Sarah. Sheila remained silent throughout the hearing. She just sat there, staring at her hands in her lap. Her lawyer spoke for her when he needed to, but she kept quiet. She looked awful, but she remained silent. When the hearing ended, I asked if the lawyers could leave so I could speak privately with Sheila. I started talking, Sheila, and I'm going to keep this brief. I did not do any of this for vengeance. I simply wanted a divorce. I just want to be as far away from you as possible. The sight of you makes me sick. You and your father caused more pain in my life than you can imagine. When your father took over and tried to railroad me, I became enraged. Everything that happened was his and your fault. He was always successful in obtaining his desired outcomes. But this time, he received exactly what he deserved. He tried to keep me from Sarah, which nearly destroyed me. I made it out alive thanks to a woman I met while hiding and thinking. I discovered something in her that you will never have, a heart and moral compass for determining what is right and wrong. And I love her. As for Sarah, I do not want you to ever see her again. I will file a restraining order against you for this. I would not allow even your filthy shadow to be near her. I would wait for you to die a painful, lonely death, and I promise to come and pee on your grave. Meanwhile, you and your father may do whatever you wish. I do not care. Please stay away from me. Do you understand what I've said? All Sheila did was nod. Yes, she never looked up. I walked out of the small hearing room feeling happier than I'd been in a long time. I thought about Anna and Sarah the entire time I walked out of the building. Later that night, I held a private ceremony in the backyard of my parents' home. I burned the DNA test results papers that sparked the whole mess.
The only person I ever told about her biological father was Anna. Almost two months ago, I landed on this same little lake in the same little float plane. I didn't like it back then, and I don't think I like it any better now. But now I had Sarah beside me. She considers it an amusement park ride. We pulled up to the dock. I saw Anna standing there, just as beautiful as I remembered. The pilot opened the door and secured the aircraft to the dock. I picked Sarah up in my arms and exited, and her smile was nearly as wide as the lake when she saw us. As we approached, she stepped to the side and wrapped her face around Sarah to give me a welcome home kiss. All the while, we were kissing. Sarah rubbed her hands over both of our faces, making small noises that sounded almost like words. I was glad to be home. It's strange that I now think Dukes is at home because Anna is there. Anna looked at me after we kissed and said, Leo, I have some bad news. Duke suffered a stroke. It's not too bad, but he lost use of his right hand and now walks like the original John Wayne. He'll be fine in time, but he needs someone to help him run this place. I said I'd stay. What are your thoughts? I was thinking as we landed that it felt like I was returning home. I assumed it was because of you, but there has to be more to it. Perhaps this is the place that feels most like home. But whatever it is, I am here for you. And I will be with you forever. We'll care for the old buzzard and our little girl at the same time. I am just glad to be back. I missed you and love you. Welcome home. I love. It's been five years since I first visited Duke's Lodge. Anna and I got married in the spring, following our first winter there. Sarah enjoyed her time here. She particularly enjoyed playing with her old teddy bear. The old teddy bear's name was Duke. The following year, we gave Sarah two little brothers to play with, Duke and Wayne, twins. Yes, we named them after old Duke, are now three years old and like all three-year-old boys are getting into everything. Anna is a wonderful mother. Every day I thank God for sending us here to find one another. I adore her more and more each day. Oh, and Anna is pregnant with our third child, a little girl due in three months. We're still deciding on a name, but we're both leaning toward Louisa. Since our first visit, the lodge has undergone significant changes. The lodge house has doubled in size, and the dirt path connecting the dock to the lodge has been paved with decorative stone walkways. We've built five new cabins on the hill and a lot of new boats. The dock is wider, and there is a lot of native artwork throughout the property, mostly totem poles and animal carvings. Duke managed the upgrades himself. The funds came from a settlement of lawsuits against Bloom in the town of Henley. Anna enjoys her new gourmet kitchen, which was generously provided by an anonymous restaurant owner from Detroit, Chicago, and Cincinnati. We even have satellite communications, courtesy of an anonymous computer geek. Another unidentified manufacturer sent us three large racks of solar collectors and a solar power generator. Since the changes, the place has been packed. There's even a waiting list for the most popular dates, confirming what the website says about us. When my parents came to visit after the twins were born, they told me that Sheila no longer has any contact with her father and lives a reclusive lifestyle. Mr. Bloom will be on probation for another six years on a federal racketeering charge. I could care less about either of them. Duke died approximately a year ago, leaving everything to Anna and me. We buried his ashes alongside his beloved Louisa near the park bench on the hill. We see him whenever we can, and his spirit lives on in the lodge. We truly miss the old buzzard. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, leave a comment below with your thoughts on what happened. Take care.